ambassadors here. We have a number of ambassadors from some of our allied and partner countries. Welcome to the members of the press corps. Welcome to all of you. Thanks very much to C-SPAN for carrying this, um, these proceedings live. And because it's live, we're going to have three panels, and they're just going to flow one into the other. There'll be no breaks. Uh, and because it's live, we ask you to silence your cell phones. Politics and Prose is here. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the book that we're launching today, this book is Technology and National Security, Maintaining America's Edge. It's the book that represents um, our study in the Aspen Strategy Group of this issue. You can buy it at Politics and Prose right here. It's a very romantic present for Valentine's Day. <laughs> Technology and national security. What could go over better than that? So the Aspen Strategy Group is launching this book today on one of America's greatest challenges, how to maintain American military superiority at a time of revolutionary technological change in artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing, biotechnology. That was the subject that 65 of us addressed last August in Aspen, Colorado in the annual meeting of our resolutely nonpartisan group the Aspen Strategy Group. We are a collection of people who have served in government, many former cabinet secretaries, who are active journalists, who are business leaders, who are academic leaders. We were founded 35 years ago by Professor Joe Nye, my friend, who's seated right before you, by Bill Perry, by Sam Nunn, and by our great friend, someone we admire very much, General Brent Scowcroft. And for 35 years, we believe that Republicans and Democrats can come together to talk, to debate, to plan forward the most important issues confronting the United States. And that's what we've done on this big issue of technology. The book that hopefully all of you have or shall have includes chapters by leading thinkers from the technolo technology field, from Silicon Valley and the tech world, from government, from academia, from business, we investigate how these new challenges to America's military dominance, in part, need to be dealt with by a better, more productive conversation between the Pentagon and America's tech community. We also examine two additional factors, China's exceedingly ambitious strategy to dominate artificial intelligence in the next decade, and of course, concomitantly, the lagging American government funding for basic science research to our universities, the breakdown of that virtuous innovation triangle that Walter Isaacson talks about in the book that really made America great in terms of our technological superiority over the last seven to eight decades. We've seen warnings from the U.S. military leadership about the consequences if the United States falls behind in the development of these new technologies and their application to the United States military. General Joe Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said last year, he said, in just a few years, if we do not change our trajectory, we will lose our qualitative and quantitative competitive advantage. We're hearing similar warnings from the American scientific community. Dr. Eric Lander, the director of the Broad Institute in our hometown of Cambridge, Massachusetts, he's referred to our American research universities as engines of discovery that attracted the best talent to our shores and sparked the world's most innovative companies. His big question is whether America will now yield its position as the world's leader in science and technology. And he said, for the first time since World War II, our primacy is in jeopardy. Many of us believe, and I think you'll hear from all three of our panels about this, this calls for a major US government effort to work with the private sector, with the tech world, and work with our research universities to revive our level of competitiveness and to make sure that the United States is putting its best foot forward as we seek to link these technologies to our military, our military technology, and our superiority going forward. Three panels today. The first panel, which Professor Nye will chair, is on the China Challenge and US tech primacy. Um, panelists are Jack Clark, from, uh, who is a director of OpenAI and who spoke at our conference and authored one of the chapters in the book. Tom Donilon, 
who is chairman of Black, the BlackRock Investment Institute. And you know Tom, longtime public servant, national security advisor for President Obama. Michelle Flournoy, CEO of West Exec Advisors, former U U.S. Undersecretary of Defense. Tom, Michelle, of course, members of the Aspen Strategy Group. The second panel, which follows at 4 p.m., will investigate this innovation triangle that is now lagging behind. That, and um, that will include Doug Beck, who's vice president of, of the Apple Corporation, Chris Brose, head of strategy for Andrew Industries and former staff director of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Sylvia Burwell, president of the American University, former uh, director of the Office of Management and Budget, former secretary for Health and Human Ser Services, and Richard Danzig, who is now senior advisor at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, former secretary of the Navy. The third panel, which begins uh, at just before 5 o'clock, will feature an interview that I'm going to do uh, with our good friend, fellow Harvard uh, professor, Ash Carter, former Secretary of Defense. Ash has lived on all points of this innovation triangle. Secretary of Defense, professor at a major research university, and someone who knows and understands and is now involved with the private sector and the tech community. So he'll be our final act. Uh, to speak about this subject today. So without further ado, welcome to everybody. And Joe, thank you for your leadership of our group over the last uh, three and a half decades, and thank you for your leadership of this panel. Thanks, Nick, and welcome to everybody. Uh, as Nick said, we're going to talk about China rising and the challenge to U.S. Uh, technological primacy. Uh, when you think about China rising, something that's been worrying me and I've written about recently is American uh, attitudes, foreign policy attitudes, are kind of like a pendulum. They swing too far in one direction and too far in another. And there is a great danger that uh, because there, maybe we weren't tough enough on the Chinese uh, in the past, that we're going to be overly tough now. People are talking about a new Cold War. And keeping a sense of balance on this uh, pendulum is, is very difficult somewhere in between complacency and hysteria. And Washington often is at one end or the other of that. Um, I was struck uh, that people who say that uh, you know China's passing the US is going to create a great war like Germany's passing Britain did in uh, uh, World War I, which disrupted the last century, um, that China's already passed us, and so forth. Uh, it's a bit exaggerated because Germany had already passed Britain by 1900, and uh, the war was until 14 years later. And what's more, the, uh, if you look at China today, uh, while some people say measuring purchasing power parity, China's bigger than the U.S., uh, purchasing power parity is a measure of welfare, not power. And you don't import oil or jet engines by purchasing power parity, you do it at exchange rates. And China's about 60% of the US, if you measure it uh, in that manner. But people say with time and growth rates of 6.5%, China will be bigger than the US. Um, the, the guess is it might be in the 2030s or so. Now, we have to be pretty careful about Chinese uh, uh, growth rates. I was in China uh, at the beginning of this month. and met with a number of businessmen, and what struck me was having Chinese businessmen say that they thought that Chinese growth rate, which is officially 6.5%, at best was half of that and probably even less. So and they said that as they make business plans, they use physical measures. They don't take the official numbers. So we don't know the answer based on the, on the data that people have in the official uh, uh, reports. But there is another argument that even if, even for example, if there is too much hype and hysteria which goes with policy fashions in Washington, there's an argument that this time is different. This time, in fact, because of AI, uh, that China has a chance to leapfrog, that the, that the normal progression that you would see uh, would be much faster in the case of AI. And a good illustration of this is the recent book by Kai-Fu Lee, who, who knows a lot about AI, and who um, 
has argued that China will indeed uh, be able to catch up to reach Xi Jinping's goal of being number one in AI by 2030. And uh, uh, people have always said in the past it's because China will have a lot more data and the machines learn from the data and they'll have less restrictions on the data, no concerns about privacy. So China's machines and algorithms will learn more quickly and that's how China will pass us. Others have said, no, you know, there's now, it's not just raw data, it's, you can have synthetic data. So this pushes some of the race or some of the problem back into the area of compute and of the, of the uh, areas that are not just determined by data. But even that is questionable. And so the Kaifu Li argument, which is a very interesting argument, which is that China will be able to leapfrog and that the view that their technology isn't up to ours is looking at the cutting edge in science, but it may be, in fact, operations in engineering, which will be the, the edge where China will beat us. So these are the kinds of questions that we need to wrestle with as we try to put this new challenge of AI into a broader perspective about what does it mean to have China as a challenger to American technological primacy. To answer it, I'm gonna first ask Jack Clark about uh, the AI arms race, what it is, where it's going. And then I'm going to ask Michelle if uh, she will tell us what the effects will be on the military balance where the Americans still are way ahead, but this, if you believe this argument, could be uh, transformed more rapidly. And then I'm gonna turn to uh, Tom Donlon and ask him to tell us about an overall strategy, both for the relationship and where the technology fits into it. So Jack, let me start by asking you, um, is Xi Jinping going to make his goal of being number one by 2030? And if there is an AR, I arms race, uh, uh, what should we be doing about it? Well, like all nerds, let me answer with a series of confusing numbers, but hopefully this will be useful. Um, there's a big AI conference going on in Hawaii right now, and you know, one of the things they do is they group nations by the number of research papers accepted to it. So this is the sort of thing you track if you want to look at where the outcome of STEM investment has, has ended up for a given nation. So there are two nations that led triple AI, one of them got 382 papers accepted to the conference, the other got 264, and every other nation was somewhere under 100. So China got 382 papers accepted, and the US got 264. So they're a peer competitor already in this. And I think it's also worth saying that, you know, one other criticism we sometimes hear of China is that they you know, may, not have, may not invent as much or they may copy more. You know, a metric for this is your number of papers you submit versus the number of papers that get accepted. China submitted way more than the US, but if you look at the actual stats, China's acceptance rate is something around 15 or 16 percent, and the US is, is around 20 or 21 percent. So this tells us kind of two things. It tells us, one, China is competitive in AI research. It's not an upstart, it's, it's truly here. And two, yes, it looks like the kind of US scientific infrastructure produces a slightly better caliber of paper right now. Now, now to your question about whether there's kind of winning here, I, I think it's worth thinking about where the technology is being developed. These are not predominantly papers from military organizations. And in fact, based on my experience, many military organizations are not, are not leading in AI. It's consumer companies, and you see this also in China. These are kind of apps, not munitions. So I think that the question for us is, to what extent do we see the tightening links between military organizations and AI development as being inevitable? And to what extent can we choose how those relationships are, are structured, both in the US and in China, so that you can have some level of collaboration. And the third point I'll, I'll leave you with is AI technologies, the, the things you've heard about them being somewhat unpredictable, somewhat uninterpretable, somewhat unexplainable, these are all basically true. And I think that no one you know, who, has, who has served in the military would like an unexplainable weapon, which is sort of what we're talking about when we talk about the arms race dynamic here. And I think that actually leads us to have 
the chance to collaborate with a peer competitor on certain norms around safety and security and interpretability so that things don't go bang when things get interesting. Great. And Michelle, that is a natural for you to follow up on. How is AI going to affect the military balance, and what should we do about it? I'll pick this up. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to the discussion. Um, so I, I do think it's important to put the military piece in context, which is that I think the primary lines of competition between the U.S. and China in the next decades will be economic and geopolitical, and that neither country would choose to go to war together. I think both will, both, you know, any administration is going to try to avoid conflict. But there are so many unresolved um, territorial issues, issues of sovereignty claims, um, things that could become triggers, uh, particularly in the context of lack of agreement between U.S. and China on the rules of the road internationally and on norms of behavior. So the name in the game of, uh, of the game, in my view, is deterrence. How do we ensure that the Chinese uh, understand that if, if there ever was a conflict that they would not actually have a chance of prevailing? And that's where the impact of AI comes in. Um, I think if, um, I, I, there, I, I do think there is a, a serious element of competition here. Um, and there is a risk that if China gets farther ahead, not only in AI in general, but in the application of AI to various military functions, whether it's intelligence analysis, targeting, strike, uh, autonomous systems, robotics, et cetera, that they could have a perception of potential advantage. Um, and could uh, that perception could uh, drive them to miscalculate, to try to adopt an asymmetric approach that would strike early and quickly, um, to try to, you know, to basically uh, have a, like a, a very strong first move um, in the hopes of stopping the U.S. in its tracks or, or, and so forth. So I think the real issue is um, how do we ensure that that misperception doesn't take hold? So I do think it's very important for us to figure out how to ensure the U.S. military can leverage AI for defense and deterrence and, if necessary, war fighting. Um, but the Chinese have several structural ex advantages. Um, they have a plan, <laughs> and they're executing on a multi-decade plan. They are putting state resources, much higher levels of money, talent, focus um, in this area. Two, they have a doctrine of civil military fusion, which means any advance in the academ academia, in private sector, gets sh that's meaningful to the military, gets shared with the PLA. Um, we obviously don't have that <laughs> here in the United States. Um, and third, they don't, they have uh, lots more access to data. They don't have the same privacy concerns. They, and, and they have a, a system that the government can dictate. Um, and uh, I don't think they will have uh, the same ethical and policy constraints, the same guardrails that the U.S. will almost certainly put on the use of AI for military purposes. So we have a number of structural um, disadvantages, and I'm sure that we could actually list more. Um, but, but I do think um, this is an important area where the U.S. Uh, needs to deepen the dialogue between the military and the technical community. We need to make sure that policy catches up with and then keeps pace with the development of AI applications. And we need to figure out this problem of integration because this is going to be essential to deterring conflict with China in the future. Michelle, let me ask you a follow-up uh, about legacy systems. Sometimes people will say, and some Chinese have written about this, that the Americans uh, may be very good at AI but the Pentagon is not going to be as good at integrating it because we're prisoner of legacy systems. If you own a lot of carriers, you're going to invest a little less in swarms of unmanned drones, which are undersea and oversea, which uh, could destroy your legacies. And it'll be like the cavalry and uh, not wanting to give up forces. Uh, is there a problem here? I mean, that. China with only two carriers, or one and a half, by the way, some people count it, um, uh, will actually be better at moving ahead in the military balance by integrating AI than we are because of, of bureaucratic inertia. 
We, we are very invested in uh, legacy systems, in the existing force structure, in the programs of record. That is all true. And I think the hard thing for the United States is the kind of tra is trading off capacity for capability when it's required. And I'll give you an example. In an anti-access, air denial environment um, where the Chinese have created a, a ring or a certain range where anything in that zone, whether it's a, car a carrier battle group or aircraft or what have you, is going to be vulnerable uh, to being struck down, um, we have to figure out how to be able to operate either outside that ring and extend, uh, you know, project our power with range or inside that ring and be able to def defend ourselves. So it may be that at some point, X plus one, you know, that additional carrier battle group that we might be tempted to add, if you actually took that money and invested it in all of the capabilities that would make the existing fleet survivable, buy back range, make it effective again, so that's electronic warfare, it's directed energy, it's cyber, it's autonomy, it's, it's you know, leveraging AI for all of that. That, may, that capability trade-off, that, that buying capability and trading off some capacity may be very important. And I don't mean to pick uh, on the Navy, because this is true for every single service is going to be, where is that, you know, they're going to have the question, where is that knee in the curve where it makes more sense for me to modernize the legacy systems with the capabilities that will keep them survivable and relevant and not have quite as large a force? Thanks. Tom, you've been thinking about the U.S.-China relationship and the overall strategy for the relationship for a long time and actually been in charge of it. Uh, uh, and you've also been a very active, important member of the Aspen Strategy Group and participated in this summer study in which we talked about the implications of AI and technological change. How do you put these pieces together in a strategy? Thanks, Joe, and Michelle, Jack, nice to be with you here today. Let me say a couple of things about it. First of all, to um, try to draw a picture of the current strategic context in just a minute or so, right? We're in a much more competitive phase. Joe, you've written about this. We're in a much more competitive phase in the U.S.-China relationship. Indeed, I think we'll look back on 2018 as a year when it became clear that the United States strategy had moved substantially, really from a, from a, a strategy of cooperative engagement, and you can pin the beginning of that maybe in February of 1972 to some extent uh, with Richard Nixon's visit there, but certainly since the end of the Cold War, uh, where the United States has engaged in a, in a cooperative engagement strategy with China trying to seek a win-win set of outcomes and integrate China into the, into the various institutions and systems in the world. Um, it's moved in 2018, I think, pretty substantially, re reflecting a fundamental rethink, a bipartisan rethink of U.S.-China relations. And I think it's fair to say that we've moved to a strategic uh, competition model at this point. Um, and it's a new era, and finding, as Michelle alluded to, finding the contours of this new era. What are the rules of the road? Where are we going to compete? How are we going to compete? And where are we going to cooperate? really is a work in progress at this point. And I don't think we've engaged in a, in a comprehensive way about that. So that's the strategic context. I think we're in a new phase in the U.S.-China relationship. Second, um, what's been front and center has been the economic issues. Uh, and the president has focused quite tightly on the bilateral trade deficit and certain market conduct activities by, uh, by China. And I think as we sit here today, Liu He, the vice premier of China in charge of the economy, is actually meeting at the White House with President Trump as part of these negotiations during this 90-day period since President uh, Xi and President Trump met in Buenos Aires uh, in, in December to try to work through these, these uh, economic issues. Um, there, there seem to be a number of things that could be done in a positive way on that to work through those, but that's not the main game. I think the main game is what we're talking about here, which really is uh, as part of this competition, a technological competition, really a competition to seize the commanding heights of the key technologies and industries of the future. And a piece of that, and I wanted to turn a question back to, back to Jack, and then I'll get to kind of just a quick summary of things I think we can do, is it seems to me that we are moving, you know, not to have a decoupling of the U.S. and Chinese economies. Uh, you know, we have a over half a trillion dollar relationship between the United States and China that's built up over the last uh, 40 years. But in the technology sectors, we are moving to a decoupling. If you look at the steps that have been taken in the United States, just in the last six months, we, we are more tightly regulating investment by China into the United States. We're about to more tightly regulate the export of technology uh, from the United States to China. 
we are restricting pretty significantly research and student uh, uh, um, entrance into the United States in terms of cooperation, and we're moving to identifying entities that we think are a security threat to the United States and undertaking global efforts to ensure that they don't uh, do things like build the 5G infrastructure. There's a global effort against Huawei based on our security and in some of our economic concerns. Um, and I wanted to ask you, when I, when I finish, maybe to turn on that, on that decoupling thing, which I think is not as broadly recognized or appreciated as it should be. Now last, a couple of points on what we should do. And Michelle indicated, I, I think touched on a lot of this. It need, it, we obviously have a comprehensive strategy that's, that, that is geopolitical and diplomatic, which is supporting allies, building the right defense doctrine and weaponry um, to um, defend ourselves and, and to continue to have to play the role we've played for over half a century as providing the security platform in East Asia on which Asian development and security has been, uh, Asian development and, and economic growth has been, uh, has, been, um, has been built. There's an ideological aspect to this, which we haven't discussed a lot, uh, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, China has a full alternative model uh, on offer. But on the technology piece in particular, Joe, I'll finish on this, I think there are a number of things that we can and should do. Um, the discussion to date has been almost all about things we're going to try to change in terms of Chinese behavior. Uh, Chinese behavior in terms of purchasing U.S. goods and services, which is positive. Chinese behavior in terms of not undertaking steps which are unfair in uh, the uh, economic, global economic uh, sphere. That's all to the good. We have had almost no discussion in a comprehensive way about what we're going to do uh, on this side in order to meet a challenge which is, as Jack describes, is coming from, in many ways, a peer scientific and technological competitor. Uh, that's the discussion I'd, I'd like to kind of, uh, kind of in, um, see us have, and it has a number of elements to it. It, it, it does involve, I think, a comprehensive private uh, government effort to think about and act on ways to enhance our key technologies, right? It does involve, uh, you know, example of that, by the way, is, is artificial intelligence. The Obama administration put out two reports in October and December of 2016 on a strategy for this. I haven't really seen any follow-up on that. The follow-up I did see is in the summer or spring of 2017 when China issued a similar <laughs> <laughs> a similar strategy that it's, that, it's, uh, that it's acting on. Walter will talk about uh, research and development, uh, fundamental research and development expenditures by the United States and support for research institutions, research universities. We, um, you know, a couple few decades ago had, were number one in terms of the percentage of R&D as a percentage of GDP that the United States expended. We're now number 12, right? And that's been, you know, really not going in the right direction. Now, a lot of that's been picked up by the, by the private sector, but it's not the same thing. I don't think going forward. Um, I do think that we need to bring science back to the center of our thinking and our policy making. We just had an, a, a director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the United States. It took two years to get somebody in that job, right? And there really isn't a focus on science. One of the great regrets I have in my tenure as National Security Advisor is not to have established an assistant to the president for technology policy inside the NSC, by the way, running an interagency process. Because every day, Michelle, as you know, these pro pro problems we faced had technological aspects to them increasingly, and there were bandwidth issues and confidence issues that we really need to address, I think, in the uh, policy making. And just a couple of, which I'll finish up on, why the United States, I think history will look back and ask why the United States during this period didn't have a major infrastructure program when we borrow money at very cheap rates and can invest it at pretty certain returns, and we haven't done any of that. We just spent $2 trillion on a tax, on a tax cut uh, last year. Um, and the last is, um, two things are really important, two last things. One is that a national effort to meet what we know are going to be the labor market implications of the technologies we're developing. Artificial intelligence, robotics, and these technologies, they're coming down the line inexorably. Uh, you know, if you spend as much time uh, with CEOs and uh, at business conferences as I do, this is where business is going, right? To get, to get additional technolo technological efficiencies. And we haven't had at all a set of discussions about who is responsible for the work impacts of these technologies. Is it companies, is it government, and what are we gonna do about it? And the last may seem like a, smaller, a small one, but I think it's really important. Uh, the Congress uh, needs to take a leadership position here as well. And in 1995, the Congress disarmed itself in terms of technological advice and disestablished the Office of Technology Assessment. It's a small institution. Uh, it didn't save much money. It was part of the Gingrich Revolution in the Congressional in the mid-1990s. Mid Nobody here is old enough to remember that. But uh, <laughs> uh, 
but we really need good advice. And, you know, and it was really on display during the Facebook hearings, right? You know, and if you saw that, right, where Congress really needs to have objective, high quality advice they can go to on things like that, but much deeper issues like the ones we're talking about today. Thanks. Well, that makes a lot of sense, but that leads me to a follow-up for Jack uh, about the strategy, which I think you were alluding to, Tom. It, 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 when people say we're in a new Cold War with China, the trouble is that it's a bad analogy. With the Soviet Union, we had almost no trade and almost no scientific or social exchange. With China, we have more trade than apparently we want, and we also have something like 300,000 Chinese students in American universities, and a lot of back and forth among the elites uh, in, at the level of the labs. As Tom pointed out, uh, on the investments and economic behavior with companies, we've upgraded CFIUS. We're taking that much more seriously. But an awful lot of technology transfer occurs uh, in human minds. And it don't, you don't have to steal this. You just work in a lab at Caltech, and you go back to to uh, Tsinghua and and take another job. I mean, look at Kai Fu Lee's own background, back and forth of Chinese and American companies. Um, what do we do about that? In other words, if if AI is as fluid as you say, uh, should we be trying to restrict uh, transfer of intellectual property by restricting who can work in American companies or have access to Caltech or MIT or Carnegie Mellon? Can I offer a quick answer? Yeah, please. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, a quiz we give new hires at OpenAI is how many languages are spoken at OpenAI. And none of them ever get it right because the answer is there are far too many to actually come up with a reasonable answer and they want to do coding or research instead. The languages include Chinese and include Russian. Right. And why is that? Well, I think it's because nerds will go for the nerd thing over nationalism. Like if you have the greatest opportunity to develop the most significant technology for, for a real aim and be part of a team that gets to change the nature of science, I think you may pick that above a particular sort of nationalistic mindset. You know, OpenAI's goal is to make sure that AI technology benefits all of humanity. We think that having some aspect of um, all of humanity working on that is essential to it. I also think it provides a motivating message that if you have enough of a progressive policy with regard to science, you can attract people from all over. And I don't believe we've suffered from it in terms of a technology transfer point of view. Um, I do want to make a point about what Tom said and grotesquely oversimplify it, which is I think that what you're talking about is the problem of uh, bullies versus nerds. Right, and in high school, you had like some bullies and they like beat up the nerds and the nerds went home and read books. And then all of the nerds did pretty well later in life and all of the bullies had a, a pretty terrible time. And I think that most of what the US is doing now is, is mostly bullying and not being nerdy enough. I accept that there needs to be some robust behavior, but in the absence of the US going home and like hitting the books in the evening, it has no chance here. That, that was the, that was the purpose of the yeah. you know, kind of the, li the list at the end. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't. Um, and it's a you know it's a, it's, it's it's a fair it's a uh, it's a fair point on this issue, Joe, of um, um, personnel, people, back and forth. You know, we have you know we have a tremendous amount, and the Kai Fu Lee book points this out. Tremendous amount of um, back and forth in terms of shared knowledge between the United States and China, the development of artificial intelligence, and a lot of technologies. Um, but there are legitimate counterintelligence issues. Uh, and uh, this presents real challenges for research universities, I think, and we really need to have to get this right uh, because cutting ourselves off completely is a mistake, right? Um, but there are issues, there are, there are legitimate counterintelligence issues. It's a really, serious, uh, a really serious challenge. One statistic I saw last week was that last year, uh, the number of foreign students studying in the United States decreased by 6.5%, which is the biggest decrease since 9-11, which is not a great trend for us. Michelle? And, and by contrast, we have we are failing to invest in the people we need um, uh, in the technical fields. Um, not only you know, uh, sort of even absent any national security application, we are not 
focused on stem education and um, investing in access to stem education uh, the way we should um, but even where we do have uh, talent we're not uh, making it easy for that talent to go between the commercial sector and the government or national security sector um, and and so I think one of the things we need to be doing for back to Tom's thing about what do we do, what, what, what's right for us, is to be thinking much more out of the box about creating pathways. So maybe we need a civilian version of ROTC, and sa which says, you know, we'll pay for your college or your graduate school uh, in a technical field if you come and spend uh, some time with the government first. Then you can go off to the commercial sector, and then we're going to create a pathway for mid-career people who want to work on the mission that matters to come do another stint at a more senior level in government. Um, we are going to figure out, you know, we, uh, I was at a dinner last night um, with General Nakasone, the head of Cyber Command, and we were talking about the talent channel challenges that Cyber Command and NSA um, have. And, you know, one of the ideas is, you know, creative ways of, 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 of leveraging talent that's outside the government. You know, should we have a different kind of reserve where you don't have to wear a military uniform or pass a physical fitness test or cut your hair or remove your <laughs> tattoo and, 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 you, but you can hack for your country on the weekends. Um, and if you can't get a security clearance, so you use a different set of data, but you still use the talent to develop the tactics and the procedures and the problem solving that you need. So we are not being innovative and at our best in terms of how we use the talent we have and how we develop more. And there's also the point that uh, if we become too restrictive, we cut off new sources of that talent. Um, I saw a figure recently that a third, more than a third of Silicon Valley startups in the last decade were started by immigrants from Asia. Uh, and so in that sense, to be too restrictive on that would be to basically cut off uh, talent that we need. So it's, it's getting a strategy right as I started out with the pendulum becoming too hysterical or too complacent, getting that point in the middle is not going to be easy. But we won't no. get it right unless we have this missing piece. And this missing piece is what we are going to do to meet the challenge. Right. Well, we're going to uh, throw it open to the audience. We have 15 minutes left in this panel. And uh, that was the time that Nick uh, uh, allocated for audience Q&A. So uh, over to you, who, who would like to ask a question. Anyone? Ali? Is there a, 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 yeah. Thanks, Professor Knight. I'm Ali Wine. I'm a policy analyst at the Rand Corporation. Um, we've talked about this term, an AI arms race, long-term competition between the United States and China. How do we measure winning? What would it mean to win in an arms race if there is one occurring? What would it mean to win in long-term competition between the US and China? How do we define the term? Tom, you want to start? We'll, we'll go down the, we'll each with quick answers go down the line. Yeah. Well, it depends. I mean, there'd be a, it, there would be different definitions in each, in, in each sector, right? You know? I think with respect to, Michelle can give some, a lot more definiteness than I can, with respect to our military side, it would be having the ability to continue to, main, to maintain the role we have in the Western Pacific to provide um, basically the platform on which you can have peaceful economic and social development. I think that's a you know, kind of a first, a first piece to it. Second, uh, you know, it's important for the United States to maintain its technological leadership in the world. Over the last 75 years, Ali, we have we have garnered tremendous um, prosperity and security and strength from our leadership in these areas. And maintaining that leadership, I think, is a very important thing for us to. And we'd have to, and we we should measure ourselves against against that. Now, how you do that unilaterally versus do that in, co in cooperation is the kind of, thing, kind of things we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. But um, not to take the steps to maintain that leadership would, would put the United States in a disadvantaged position, unnecessarily in my view. I, mean, I think if you still do a net assessment of the United States assets and liabilities, you would come to the conclusion the United States, if it makes the right policy decisions, can maintain its position as a leading country in the world going forward. But you'd have to take them piece by piece. I do think it, it also is important for us to focus on our ideological, this ideological competition in the world too. You know, we have a situation where I think democracy in the United States and, and in the West generally is under maybe the most severe assault since the 1930s from a variety of sectors and, and strengthening 
that aspect of our essence, right, and continuing to do that you know, through things like civic education and critical thinking is also another important part of this going forward. So Jack? Just, yeah, very briefly, um, I think to win, you need to know what the race course looks like. And currently, we don't have an ability to make good judgments about the health of US scientific infrastructure. Like, I'm pulling anecdotal conference data from AAAI to tell you something about competition between nations. I think that's wildly insufficient. And I, I sort of agree with Tom's point, but we need better decision-making capacity within government to actually measure this stuff, because otherwise, you're just going to pick something arbitrary and uh, that's probably the point when dangerous things could happen. I think in winning in the military sphere beyond the geopolitical point that Tom made is really, in the AI sphere, it will really come down to speed, quality of situational awareness, speed of decision, and speed of execution. And if a competitor becomes much better at all of those things than we are, deterrence will break down. And that's when you risk aggression or a conflict. Michelle, I have to ask you about uh, what's the implication of that for the third offset, which was the argument at the in the Defense Department at near the end of the Obama administration that uh, we had always been able to offset our opponents' uh, military capabilities by having a technological edge. And Bob Work first talked about a nuclear edge, and then it was the uh, precision and stealth in the 70s, 80s, and then the idea is that we would be trying to keep ahead with a third offset, and we should be working on the third offset. Does this speed of AI and this high degree of integration make the idea of a third offset obsolete? Not at all. I think it reinforces the importance. And although it's not being called a third offset any, uh, strategy anymore because every administration has to rename the old strategy and put it in a new brand, it is you know what the department's actually doing and what Secretary Mattis in particular has tried to uh, do in moving money, particularly in the what will come out in the 2020 budget, towards much more robust uh, investment in some of these key technologies. It will actually it is key to for the, you know, that technological investment is still very important for the United States to be able to offset um, what will be quantitative advantages and home theater advantages for uh, a country like China if we ever had to deal with a conflict in, in, in Asia in their backyard. Can I quickly make one yeah. point? Um, so I feel I should, I should represent sort of the view from Silicon Valley on one aspect of this question, which is there's kind of two types of winning here. There's winning where you have like a superior exquisite military capability and that's fine, except that the way that you'll probably get to it is by having stuff that can operate like a faster OODA loop in a more integrated way than your opponent. The, the issue of a lot of this AI stuff is you need to test it empirically against real data to see what happens. And I think that it, it, is, it is worth bearing in mind that if you have a race dynamic which leads to you fielding like who can have the fastest OODA loop with increasingly integrated decision-making capabilities that need to be empirically tested because you don't have theoretical guarantees, then you're, if you win, something really dangerous might happen while you win. And we really don't want that to happen. I think there is another path here, which is that, you know, should the U.S. invest more in the actual sort of technology infrastructure and substrate which all of this sits on, it could create the sorts of technologies that allow for more robustness and explainability and guarantees that you can have a competition which doesn't seem to risk most human life in the process. Just thought I should represent that to you. Uh, Tom, you want to add on that? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay, another shot. Yes. Hi, uh, Jill Doherty from the Wilson Center. I have a question, um, c uh, something that Tom mentioned at the top, the rules of, let's say, the rules of war. <laughs> Can you um, actually come up with any viable way of creating any rules of competition when you have countries that do not look at human rights or civil society, government, the way the United States does? Jill, I think so, and I think it's incumbent on us to do that. You know, we have two different, two very different systems. Uh, we are in, as I said, a, a new phase of competition. Um, 
and, and some of it, um, it matters a lot. You know, as Joe, Joe, Joe said at the beginning, you know, whether you win some of these races, I think will make a big difference. And as Jack just said, I think who gets in the lead in some of these, uh, in some of these uh, technologies will make a big difference on standard setting and ethics and, da and the risk, risks that we face. But um, we have to set a set of rules of the road. One of the principal management challenges for leadership in the United States and China over the next, you name the number of decades, right, half century into the 21st century, uh, will be uh, to manage this relationship um, and, and not have it on a path towards inevitable conflict. Um, and there will be areas where we will compete. There will be areas where we will engage and try to force behavior changes on either side, like we're trying to do now, I think, correctly on the economic side. And there will be areas where, we, where we're going to need to work together. Uh, there, there, you know, there are a number of obvious issues in the world uh, that can only be uh, solved through international cooperation. And it will be incumbent on, I think, leadership in the United States and China to find those areas of, of um, uh, areas of cooperation. So it, 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 like in all these great power relations that become this complex, and we really never faced one, I don't think, Joe, as complex as this, frankly. Um, you have to find a mix, uh, and I think um, that's really kind of maybe the principal diplomatic and strategic, strategic challenge for U.S. leadership in the coming in the coming century. Yeah, I, I, I just might add to that, Joe. That, um, ideological differences don't prevent agreement on rules of the road. We had deep, deeper ideological differences with the Soviet Union in the Cold War than we have with the Chinese today. And yet we were able to sign very a number of arms control agreements, non-proliferation treaty, but even things like incidents at sea agreement, which restricted the way we behaved in terms of uh, incidents at sea. So I, I, I think it's quite plausible to think of negotiating out of self-interest rules of the road, even though there are deep ideological differences. Can, can I just add one point beyond the bilateral rules that we can negotiate? Um, even when you know your, you know your competitor won't accept certain norms, it's still very valuable to build international, as much international consensus around AI norms or cyber norms or what have you as possible. Because w if there is a violation, then you have the weight of the international community responding, uh, you know, co cost in, imposing costs, imposing punishments for that. So there's still value even when you can't reach agreement on a bilateral basis. I really agree with that. You know, it, you have to come to these come to these situations. You know, Dean Atchison used to call them you know, try to build situations of strength, right? You know, so the United States has a lot of strength in the, in the, in the, in, in, uh, in these situations. And the, one of the principal ones is it, its alliances, the style of its leadership over the last 75 years to try to build, as Michelle said, you know, kind of large groupings of countries pursuing certain norms um, to try to obviously be a bulwark against um, uh, against threats. Uh, to be a forcing mechanism for trying to change behaviors. Um, it's so I, um, you know, and we won't be able to do that though, uh, unless we do kind of build out our strength. And, and, and in particular, uh, if we don't get our act together economically and technologically uh, here, where we, where we could get I passed by. more than you would expect, for example, with the Chinese scientists with the HIV baby, who did a postdoc at Stanford, unfortunately, a sledgehammer came down on him in China. And there aren't really any good norms around gene editing and CRISPR yet, but I was um, positively surprised by that. My question to all of you on the panel is, on the technical decoupling, it feels like we've just done the low-hanging fruit. We clearly had to reform CFIUS. We should tighten up export controls a little bit, but now what? Now I think it gets really hard because when I talk to folks out in Silicon Valley, they don't, they don't actually want to shut down their AI labs in China. They're getting a lot of good value out of that. This is your point to nerds want to cooperate. Um, and if we're not allowed to do that or you're not allowed to have grad students in the US doing this kind of work from China, then the big companies that dominate this space will cooperate with the Chinese through their labs in Europe. So where do you go from here? What's the next step in the decoupling if we think it's a good idea? Jack, do you want to start and then go to Tom? Uh, I mean, I don't think decoupling is a particularly wise idea further than what we've done. I, I think that China is already making significant overtures to scientists all around the world to come and set up well-funded labs there. 
if we continue to like technologically decouple, then the world's talent goes and does scientific breakthroughs in China, and the US is restricted to an increasingly small base of the students which it chooses to let in because of where they're from and that it thinks that they're not a threat. And I think that that seems intrinsically risky. No, I think, well, I think it is. I, I do think, though, Anya, that the, um, you know, I, I made the point in decoupling just as a statement of fact. Um, and I do think we have to think through in a longer term basis what it means. But we are, you know, the amount of money coming in from, the, from, chi from China and the United States in technological data uh, or any, any sort of sense of investment is really, really dropping to almost zero. Um, we are going to put in place export controls, going to be much tighter on technology. You know, Bob Gates, I think, gave good kind of advice in the past, in this, which is to have a, a small garden and a high fence around the things that really, that really matter. Uh, we are engaged in, a, as I said earlier, a global effort on uh, the build out of 5G uh, to try to protect US economic and, and um, security interests around the world. I think we're at the front end of it. I think you, you, may, you, raise, you raise a good point, and I don't know that we've thought through all the implications, but as a fact, it's what's happening. No, I was just going to say, I think we need a very uh, dispassionate, systematic kind of end-to-end -end approach looking at where is cooperation fine and, and a good thing and in our interests and for advancing the good of humanity, and where do we need to be clear-eyed and say this actually will pose a national security risk to the United States and to our allies if we're not careful. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is the kind of topic that the new na commission that's been stood up, the National Commission on AI, will get after. Um, it's definitely going to get after Tom's agenda of what should we be doing to better compete. Um, but I hope we'll also, it'll help, you know, bring some nuance to this question of, you know, where is collaboration fine and, and where do we need to be really much more careful than we have been. You have people, everyone from people like Eric Schmidt to, you know, Bob Work, my colleague at West Exec and former Deputy Secretary of Defense who's quite clear-eyed on these issues, you know, working on that commission. So my hope is that they can provide some some inter you know some ans better answer to your question. We're ready for the next panel, but great, good, very quick questions. Very, very quick. Um, sir, um, I'd like to ask uh, a little bit. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Greg Allen from the Center for a New American Security. Um, Mr. Donlin, you talked about the need for sort of a massive scale of change. I mean, you were talking specifically about the references of percentage of GDP, right, that we spend on research and development. So what you're calling for is a major transformation. And I think that's in line with what China is talking about. That's in line with what the major technology companies are doing. They refer to the transformation required for AI. Uh, Mike, but we also heard about the panel about the need to not panic uh, and the need to not panic uh, specifically with regards to our relationship with China. So my question is, you know, what are credible paths to the transformation of the U.S. government and the transformation of the U.S. society that involve percentage points of GDP scale changes uh, that are not, you know, induced by a Sputnik-like moment or some other cause of national panic? How do you induce the amount of change that you want without uh, calling forth, you know, some kind of national panic? Well, I think the answer to the question is leadership, and I do think we, we do need a, you know, the Sputnik moment obviously was, was in the context of the late 1950s of the Cold War. Uh, and induced by a lot of fear of falling behind an ideological competitor. Um, we have a different kind of competitor here, um, and I do think we do need, you know, Greg, I think we need a Sputnik moment in the United States. Um, I do think that the things that I laid out with respect to what we're going to do in order to advance our technological prowess and future are pretty urgent, uh, frankly. You know, I mean, Jack knows infinitely more about this than I do, but the pace is, as do you, at the pace at which these technologies develop now are extraordinary. Uh, and so the, the distance in terms of technological development in the, of the course of a single administration, for example, a four or five year period, is extraordinary. And things that might have been relevant four years ago are totally under, irrelevant now. So I, I don't think we should be, you know, I think we should address the Chinese relationship from a strategic perspective and from a position of strength. But I do feel a very deep sense of urgency on the missing piece here which is the piece about what we're going to do to maintain our technological balance. So I do think it's, it's actually odd to me that we haven't felt this as kind of a Sputnik moment. And it's odd to me that when, we, when we're talking about China, the China-U.S. relationship is the most important strategic thing we're doing in the world, that we haven't had this as a more urgent priority. We're, alas, going to have to end there. I noticed several other questions, but I can't 
indulge them because we're on to our next panel and Nick runs a tight shop, so coming right up on the stage, our next group. Please thank our first panel. Richard, join us. Doug. Well, thank you, everyone. Sure. Sure. By the way, that last questioner is a young gentleman named Greg Allen, who's now at the Center for New American Security. Greg was a student of Professor Nye and of myself and uh, spoke at our conference and is one of the leading young thinkers about AI and our military future. So I, I thank Greg for being here. This is the second panel. First panel focused on the China challenge. You heard from them. This panel focuses on a different challenge. Uh, the last chapter of our book is written by our friend Walter Isaacson, who, as you know, is a great biographer and a student and really an expert on science and technology. Walter. Walter says, what made America great technologically, from the Manhattan Project all the way through to this decade, was the combination, he says, an innovation triangle, a virtuous triangle, of the federal government believing that part of its obligation was to fund science research, long-term science research, that the federal government ought to be working with our research universities and ought to be working with the third point in the triangle, our private technology companies uh, to innovate and to encourage companies to develop as happened in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 90s, and into this century. And Walter says that's now broken down. Some arresting data points from Walter's argument just to get this conversation started. Federal R&D spending has shrunk significantly over the last few decades. Once the world leader, and Tom Donilon mentioned this, the United States now ranks 12th in government-funded R&D as a percentage of gross domestic product. Federal R&D spending has declined over 40 years from 1.2% of GDP to 0.8% of GDP, uh, 1.2 in 1976, 0 0.8 in 2016. Here's another way to look at this, this problem. Walter says in the 1960s, around 70% of total R&D was federally funded with 30% coming from the private sector, now those figures are reversed. And finally, this is a little cheeky of Walter, but I had to draw attention to it. He said in President Trump's 5,000, approximately 5,000 tweets over the last two years, barely a mention of the word science and technology. Just to illustrate the problem that we're in. We have a all-star, I would say we have a hybrid uh, panel here of people who have actually participated at each end of the triangle in the federal government, in the universities, and in the private sector, led by our good friend Sylvia Mathros, Matthews Burwell, who's a member of the Aspen Strategy Group of long standing, president now of American University, former director of the Office of Management and Budget, former Secretary of Health and Sur uh, Human Services, former senior official at the Gates Foundation, former senior corporate official. So Sylvia has had, has had direct experience at all points of the triangle. And Sylvia is gonna speak first. Our good friend Doug Beck, Doug is Vice President for the Americas in Northeast Asia for Apple in Cupertino, California. He reports directly to Tim Cook. But Doug is hybrid because Doug's a Naval Reserve officer, and he is a combat veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan. He's someone who has a deep appreciation for our university system. Uh, so Doug's gonna speak second. Our good friend Chris Burroughs, a new member and very valued member of the Aspen Strategy Group. Chris was, uh, a lot of you know him from staff director for the Senate Armed Services Committee for Chairman, the late John, Chairman John McCain. And so Chris saw this problem as the Congress thought about our national security, but Chris is now head of strategy 
at Andrill Industries, so he's in the tech world, having been uh, in the government world. And finally, and definitely not least, but last, is Richard Danzig, Senior Advisor, Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Richard is former Secretary of the Navy. And so all of these people have seen the problem from ground up, from leadership positions as well. And Sylvia, how do you answer Walter's challenge? He says the innovation triangle is no longer functioning. We're falling behind. We're 12th in the world as a percentage of uh, R&D spending. What's the answer to that? So I'll um, thank you for having me, Nick, and I will add my name to the list of those taught by Joe Nye uh, on, on that long list. And I just want to make three points in answering that question. One about how do we get to a better place in terms of solving this problem of the weakening of those three entities working together. A little point on context, and then the third point I would like to make is about the universities and perhaps thinking about the history of how we thought about the role in maybe a slightly different way. The first thing I would just say in terms of how do we get to a different place, and I think it is about the prioritization that the conversation just ended with, uh, that we need to make this issue of how we think about research and technology and our national interest and national security. It needs to be a priority in a way that it hasn't. And one way to do that that I think makes a difference is actually being clear about what is it we're trying to achieve and which of the entities, the private sector, universities, and government, what role is each going to play? And often they, there are shared roles, but how much? How much responsibility? But think about it in a clearly articulated way so that the partnership can function with the same goals and knowing what role each is supposed to play. And a couple suggestions. One is our national defense strategy, making this a core part of our national defense strategy making this a core part of our national security strategy. And then also when one thinks about making this happen throughout government. So when the Office of Science and Technology Policy is putting together its overarching strategy for the entire administration and federal government, this is a core element. And so by articulating in all the different parts and strategies that touch on this, a strategic objective that flows through all, and then a little bit more clarity about what the actual roles are of the differing parts and pieces, including how much funding for this do you want from the federal government. The second thing I would just say is context is important. And while this certainly isn't a conversation about the shutdown and the current state that we're in in terms of budget issues, I think it's important to reflect on them. The numbers that Nick mentioned, that the piece mentions, are part of a broader context of declining spending on non-defense discretionary, and as a percentage of GDP, that's as a percentage of GDP, similarly for defense. And so as we think about solving this problem and how you're going to solve it, if resources from the federal government are a part of it, one needs to consider that context. Shrinking non-defense discretionary, and that's where the research money would be, shrinking as a percentage of GDP in a context where our debt payments continue to rise. That has to do with the deficits that we have. In a context where, because we have an older generation coming through the pipeline, both Social Security and Medicare to entitlements continue to grow. So it's a very important contextual point as one considers resources. The third point I would just make is, as we think about this relationship of the entities from a university perspective, um, one of the things, this strategy approach, I think, is important because it's also about signaling to the universities. It's not just about giving them the resources. It is about signaling. Many universities today in the current situation where I would be the first to say that the economics of higher ed are troubling uh, and in terms of inflation that is higher than core inflation on a consistent basis, that's a difficulty. But as universities are looking for those funds in the research space, they are being pressed more and more for applied research. We need to produce students that are job ready and we need to produce research that's ready to make something now. And so the signaling will be an important part. And as we think about universities, thinking about the university role in three different ways. One, the research we produce. What is the research you want us doing as universities? What is it that society needs in terms of what is that research? How much applied that will be more quickly applied and how much basic research. 
The second thing is we are producing the people that are going to implement this policy. The students that are coming through, whether it's our School of International Service or our College of Arts and Sciences in Computer Science, we are producing the students that are going to do this. So understanding what that strategy is is important to how we are educating the students. And the third area, and I don't think this is traditionally We've thought about it, but as we talk about AI and these other things, the role that the university has in shaping the sector and informing the sector, things like ethics and AI, and the work that needs to be done that can be done in a university setting. Can I ask you a quick follow-up, Sylvia, because you've been at the cabinet level, now head of a university. Um, I quoted before you came in at the very beginning of this session, Eric Lander, director of the Broad Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He said, because of what you just talked about, we're risking our primacy in science and technology that we've had since the Second World War. I quoted General Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who said, we are, we're risking our military superiority. What he was essentially saying was, the development of these technologies is so rapid that our platform systems that dominate now might be obsolete 10 years from now. In other words, we're not protecting our seed corn, if you think about it that way. Tom Donilon gave us a lot of thoughts. What, what would constitute a national strategy? Do you agree with him that the president, President Trump, President Trump's successor, need to create a vision for what the private sector, universities, government should do? Yes, and I think it's, um, is it, about, it is about saying, what is it we are trying to achieve and what are we doing? Um, I think the China conversation probably got a little into how the Chinese think about it in terms of how they define where they are going with regard to questions of superiority and with regard to the question of the investment uh, that they're willing to make against this. And similarly, I think as a nation, we need that kind of leadership in terms of, here's what our objective is, here's where we're going, and also the leadership in perhaps thinking about things a little differently. The question I guess I would raise also about the nimbleness point that you raised is, how should one divide the responsibilities? Are, how sh should universities become more nimble, or should we depend more on the private sector, which I'm sure Doug's gonna uh, speak about, in terms of <coughs> thinking through what percentage of what role, and what qualities do universities, the government, and the private sector bring to the problem? I think we all need to step back and understand how do we help do what we do best in each of the places, and if we need to do things better. So the president, the nation as a whole, saying this is a priority. And I think we all know, whatever you do in your life, you know if you make it a priority, that's generally how you get things to happen. Thank you. Doug, great to have you with us. Doug spoke uh, in August at our conference and has been a big part of this. So, uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge honor for me to be here uh, um, among such august company. Um, first, I guess, uh, you know, uh, just going back to the point uh, that uh, Walter made in the, um, in the book, um, the, the Silicon Valley in which I work uh, is, was, which is, uh, uh, without, uh, without any argument, the most innovative, uh, disruptive engine of uh, innovation around the world. Um, and that Silicon Valley was, uh, was completely built on the shoulders of the innovation triangle that Walter's talking about. Um, so today, Silicon Valley completely rests on that. In fact, physically rests on it. So the, the new, uh, our new beautiful Apple campus, uh, Apple Park, uh, was was literally built uh, on a site that used to be an HP campus uh, a long time ago that was was directly part of that phase of Silicon Valley's uh, history. So we very clearly live right uh, on top of that, and and the the end and yet the engine of innovation that's there we're barely scratching the surface of that. I believe uh, for. Uh, for our, uh, the topic of national security, when I think about it from my other lens. Um, and, uh, and so actually back in, I think, 2014, when I was involved in some conversations uh, that ultimately led to the creation of the Defense Innovation Unit uh, out, in, uh, out in California and then in, in Austin and Boston, um, one of the, the points that I made then was that you could argue uh, that the relationship between uh, Silicon Valley and, uh, uh, and China 
um, not, not the Chinese government, um, but, but, but Chinese companies uh, and China in general was, was potentially tighter than the relationship uh, with the Defense Department and that the relationship that the Defense Department had with other militaries around the world um, was, uh, was arguably a lot tighter than the relationship that the Defense Department had with, uh, with Silicon Valley. Now the good news is a lot has happened since then and uh, you know, we're gonna hear from Secretary, Car Secretary Carter um, a little bit later. Uh, all the work that uh, he put in the Secretary Mattis continue, that Secretary uh, uh, Shanahan is continuing, um, has done a lot on that. And so the good news is uh, with things like the Defense Innovation Unit, we, you know, we have almost, we have an embassy. The bad news is that we need one. Um, and, uh, and that that's still an issue. Uh, and so I, I think there's some structural and cultural uh, issues that are behind this. So um, maybe thinking about culture quickly first. Um, you know, I, I, live in, I live in two worlds. Uh, and I am, uh, I'm literally the only person that some of my friends uh, in, uh, in the Valley uh, know who uh, served in uniform, much less in combat. Um, and, uh, and I'm also the only person, although this is changing, as many people get off active duty and move out to the technology sector, that many of my friends uh, in the military uh, know who live in the world that I live in, in on a full-time basis. Um, and the, the, I'm constantly struck by the depth of misunderstanding uh, that exists uh, between those two groups and the depth of, of misinterpretation um, that's represented in the, the lenses with which uh, each kind of views one another's uh, motivations and decisions. Um, and, uh, and so if, if you drill into that a little bit, um, the, uh, it, it even gets down to things that are so simple as how you dress. So I'm wearing one of my uniforms today. Uh, one that I wear barely, essentially never, except when I'm here. recognize in, you, right? I, except when I'm here in Washington uh, or uh, at a funeral, um, <laughs> and um, uh, and and. But what's interesting is, you know, out in uh, in the valley, we wear jeans, um, and uh, and and some people even wear flip flops. I don't, but others do, um, and that you know that way of dressing uh, doesn't say. Uh, sloppy or disrespectful, which is what it would say to my friends from the Pentagon. Um, that way of dressing says authentic, unencumbered, focused on what matters, not what doesn't. Um, innovative, open. Um, and by the way, wearing a suit says the exact opposite. Uh, and so when these two groups come together, before they even start, they're overcoming uh, cultural differences that are pretty profound. Um, and that, uh, that really get in the way of the kind of collaboration that we need. Um, now all that said, uh, there are some, some misinterpretations that since I'm speaking to this audience right now, uh, you know, I think it, it may be worth bringing out. First of all, I think there's, um, uh, there, there may be a misinterpretation that somehow people out in the Valley um, and in other technology hubs um, don't care about serving the public good. And that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, one of the reasons that I ended up working uh, in the Valley, where I ended up working for Apple, is because I found a group of people who woke up every day and believed that what they were doing was trying to make the world a better place. Um, and, uh, and that was what motivated people. Uh, more than any of the other things that you might think motivate uh, those, uh, those people. Um, and so I feel very at home there uh, with both my hats. Um, second, I think it's a misinterpretation to think that uh, people aren't, aren't patriotic. Um, uh, I, I just, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, when uh, my, my friends are, and the people that I know are universally supportive of, uh, of my service, when we hold events, uh, we bring people from uh, senior military folks out to visit, they're packed. Um, uh, people care deeply. Um, so, so I think that's a, mis a, a maybe misinterpretation. Um, I also think um, that uh, it, it, it's also a maybe uh, partial understanding to say that people are, uh, wouldn't be interested in working on these incredibly important problems of, uh, that are related to national security. In fact, as I think Jack said, what, what a lot of the people uh, in, in the Valley care about most 
is working on the hardest problems. And I might flip, you know, what, what Jack said was that they care about working on those hardest problems and they may not be as tied to nationalism. On the other hand, I think if you can give somebody uh, something that's one of the hardest problems and connect it to something that's even more greater than themselves, uh, like the greater good uh, of the nation, a lot of people uh, would find that incredibly, uh, profoundly attractive. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's also, I think, a uh, would be wrong to think that these very, very global companies, even the most global, um, are are as global as some might think they are um, uh, in uh, in their in their ethos, at least. So, um, Apple's a very global company, but uh, our hardware, software, services, the the vast majority of that design and IP, it's all resident in the United States. And as Tim has said publicly, Apple would not exist uh, without the United States, and we feel that very profoundly. And last, and maybe on that point, um, I think it would be uh, it's a mistake to think that uh, uh, that. Um, the, the Valley uh, or the tech sector in general is, is monolithic um, because it really isn't. Um, first of all, there's Silicon Valley, isn't Boston, isn't Austin, isn't everywhere else. Um, second, you have a very broad range of companies with very, very different business models. Um, some of them are product companies um, like, uh, like, uh, like the one that I work for where uh, the, the most fundamental point is that individuals and institutions need to trust that uh, that device with their most uh, their most private data. Others of them are fundamentally built with business models around using that data and the infinite kind of tailoring of experience based on that data um, and advertising based on that data um, that create very, very different perspectives. And that's why Apple, for example, is a very different per point of view on privacy than Facebook does. Um, those are very, very different. And so mono it's, it's not monolithic. Um, so there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot there that's still, I think, an opportunity to, uh, uh, for us to build on. Do I, do I have time to do a couple of thoughts on what may we do about that? Can, can we, we, come, come, back? Can we yep. come back to that? We will come back to that. Okay. I just want to get um, Chris and um, Richard into the conversation, but I'll come back Perfect. to your, your action plan. Chris, you just recently made the transition from the government, Senate, Armed Services Committee, to the tech sector. How do you see, based on what Sylvia and Doug have said, how do you see this challenge? Yeah, um, great, so you guys can hear me. I would say uh, the two months that I've spent in American technology has just deepened the opinions that I formed through nine years uh, working in the United States Senate. Um, and I'll explain that. You know, when I, when I think about, you know, kind of a healthy innovation base or community, um, the metric I look at more and more is less how much money is going into federally funded research I look more at how much money is the government spending to take really great research, development, science, and technology and turn it into large-scale technology, products, companies, operational capability. And I think that's where, we, that's where we fall down, and that's the thing that I am concerned about. So when I think about the triangle, I don't know if it's a square or whether you know the, the private, I would divide the private piece uh, up into people who build technology and investors in technology. Um, and I think that right now, you know, we, we basically have all of our incentives misaligned. Um, so the government, you know, really since the end of the Cold War, hasn't really had a clear idea of what it wants to do, you know, what its strategy is. And then specifically coming out of that, you know, what actual technologies it cares about more than others. Um, so what you get, you know, then in the investment community is a bunch of very risk averse capital that is gonna go where the money is. Um, and the money has more often been in ad optimization or cat facial recognition software, uh, not you know, next generation hypersonics or the operationalization of artificial intelligence. Um, so when we scratch our head and wonder why you know, all of the best minds in American technology are doing ad optimization you know, rather than working for the Department of Defense, you know, there are huge financial incentives that explain, I think, in pretty good uh, degree of clarity like why that is. Um, and then I think, you know, on the, on the back end of that, in terms of the technology that you get, um, you know, we, we shouldn't be surprised that, you know, the, the divide has grown up the way that it is because the U.S. government, uh, the Department of Defense in particular, uh, thinks about investment in technology as making large amounts of very small bets. Um, so if you're doing something really exciting in the 
R and D space. You know, we'll give you five hundred thousand dollars to do a little bit more and a little bit more, but then it never goes anywhere. So you you have a situation like we have today, where since the end of the Cold War, there are two, count them, uh, companies that began as startups focused on national security work that have become multi-billion-dollar companies: Palantir and SpaceX. You know, if you look at financial technology, biotechnology, com you know, consumer electronics. There are dozens in all of these different areas. Um, so why is it there, there are two? Both of them were founded by billionaires. They had to fight their way over many years into the federal marketplace and then ultimately sue their customers to get a fair hearing. Um, so I think, you know, to me, it's like the, the, that's the bad news, right? The good news is that we have all of the raw material to do this and be successful. We just need to think about realigning our incentives. Right? The U.S. government needs to define in a high degree of clarity what it cares about more than other things. And it needs to be willing to actually put big bets on those things. Um, and this isn't rocket science. Like, this is what we did before. Um, you know, at the, end of the, or the beginning of the Cold War, uh, the United States said, I want to put a nuclear weapon on the other side of the planet in a matter of minutes. And we bet on people. Right? We bet on Benny Schriever to do that. We bet on industry partners who could deliver that. And we put huge amounts of money into it. Um, we need to do that kind of thing again if we actually say we're going to do the things we say we want to do and prioritize uh, the technologies that we say that you know, are more important than others. We need to stop making large amounts of very little bets that never go anywhere and start concentrating our bets on the things we say we care about more than other things, which is something that the, you know, the national security acquisition community has been reluctant to do heretofore. Um, if you start doing that, uh, it should not come as a surprise that some of those things are going to fail. Many of them will. Some of them are going to succeed, and when they succeed, they'll succeed big. Um, when they succeed big, that risk-averse capital will start saying, hold on, there's money to be made in that massive $700 billion entity called the national defense market. You know, we actually want to start funding more of these kinds of companies. Um, you know, the kids that are sitting around doing really interesting work for you know, Facebook or Google, will say, actually, I'm going to go live my dream of becoming a next generation national security contractor. Um, I'm going to start putting together autonomous systems uh, in my garage, because that's what I want to do. And lo and behold, I can make billions of dollars doing it. Um, but again, the, the government needs to be the prime mover in this. It needs to know what it wants, what its, what its views is more important than other things, and it needs to put real money into them, not necessarily in the R&D stage, um, you know, the R&D that is being done in the private sector and the, uh, you know, private communities dwarfs what the federal government is spending. You know, the comparative advantage of the government is actually buying the best of it at scale um, and picking winners, being willing to say, you know, Doug has developed something that is going to change the way, you know, American national security exists. Um, and we're going to put money into that. And, you know, again, crazy idea, but this is, I'm pretty sure, how it works in, you know, the world that I now inhabit. I mean, when, when Elon Musk showed up and said, I want to go to Mars, and by the way, I need to develop reusable rockets and, you know, you know uh, rocket engines that are non lox kerosene, you know, 200 people probably walked in and said, I want to reinvent national security space. Um, he got the investment. You know, he became a billionaire because they bet on people. You know, I think we as the government need to start betting on people, which is what we've done when we've been successful in the past. I think it's what you know, private industry does every day. You know, they bet on Jeff Bezos, and they bet on Elon Musk. And lo and behold, you know, amazing people do amazing things, and they solve amazing problems. Um, I think we just need to figure out, you know, from a US government standpoint, where our you know, area of maximum impact is and start putting real money toward that rather than chasing things that I would argue are you know, less important than areas where we're less able to influence. Thank you, Chris. Really helpful in drawing this connection of where we need to, uh, to go. When we began to think about this subject and plan our conference and think about the book, uh, Joe and I and Condi Rice and I turned to Richard Danzig, uh, who has thought deeply about these issues as a foreign policy intellectual, but also has been in the government and had to plan for the future of the U.S. Navy. So Richard, what is your sense of this big problem? Well, <clears throat> Doug began by saying what a great honor it was to be on this panel, and I want to reinforce that. Nick began by saying, uh, I thought very nicely, how Greg Allen was a young student of his. We're all students of Nick Burns, just that some of us aren't young. Um, <laughs> but, but I say this in praise of my co-panelists, because I want to spend one of my four or five minutes um, 
reinforcing their description of the problem. But then I want to argue that you shouldn't really listen to them, that though this is a real problem, it's uh, distracting from a much more fundamental problem, and in fact is as misleading as it is beneficial. Um, the reason I want to reinforce it first is because basically it's right. Um, it's a right description of the world, Walter's uh, paper, the basic perception that we've shifted from a government-dominated scene to a commercial one, the need to adjust to that is right. Nicholas Negroponte in his book, The Digital Age, published in the 1990s, nicely says, uh, when photographers wanted to invent new technologies or have new technologies, they went out and invented them themselves. They made new film, they thought of new ways of uh, designing lenses, they came up with new systems of developing film. Um, they made their own world. He then goes on very nicely to say, nobody thinks that actors invented television. The technology outran the desire of the actor, and the actor had to adapt to that. And essentially, in my view, those of us who work, worked in the Pentagon as I did in the last quarter of the 20th century, we were all photographers. The uh, coming of uh, GPS, the internet, the semiconductor industry, et cetera, et cetera. These were all driven by smart people in the Pentagon as targets. And now the world is quite different. Now we're all television actors. We have to respond to the technologies. There are exceptions. The commercial world is not driving hypersonics, et cetera. But the basic point is right. The reason, though, that I say that it's distracting is these dazzlingly insightful comments, I think, truly distract us from the fundamental problem, which, in my opinion, is not one of the relationship between industry and the government and the Pentagon, for example, the national security establishment. It's one of assimilation. The problem is not uh, one of what Doug Beck has nicely described as the membrane or the permeable membrane between industry and government. It's the autoimmune response within government to these new technologies. This was touched on a bit in the last panel when Joe Nye said, uh, asked uh, Michelle and others about the legacy systems that so dominate. Let me take as my one example, we can talk more if you like about other examples, the artificial intelligence discussion that dominated the previous panel. Is the problem of artificial intelligence that this system or these systems of machine learning, deep learning, et cetera, are not available to the Pentagon or accessible? They're wildly so. We have a brouhaha about Project Maven and Google withdrawing, but lots of companies are providing lots of flow of information in these areas. The problem is that when we look at the other side, the ability to assimilate this information, I note, and I'll just give you a sort of top three, on the personnel side, I don't see substantial numbers of people in the uniform military service capable of understanding this in a way that the private companies would specially value. The number of people who are good at artificial intelligence in a serious way within the military services in uniform in the younger ranks, which is the only place they are, is probably countable on the fingers of both hands um, in each service. Uh, that is way too small, and our personnel system hugely discourages them. You cannot get promoted as an enlisted person or as an officer to the higher ranks if you, in fact, remain in this specialty. So even those people who are extraordinarily good, we push out of the services because the private sector says we'll give you real responsibility. It's much easier for the armed services to respond to this by saying, well, we don't get enough from industry. There's this external problem we need to establish, relationships out there, and not to come to grips with this. Second, everybody says about artificial intelligence, Jack Clark said it in the previous panel, data is crucial. The armed services generate huge amounts of data. What do they do with it? Essentially, they throw it away. They do not invest in storage capacity. They don't label it. They don't retain it. They don't think about artificial intelligence this way. This is not a problem of the external relationship. It's a problem of what you're doing with the internal resources. And third, there's the question of strategy. It's easy to take a technology like artificial intelligence and use it uh, to do old things in new ways, as, for example, Project Maven image recognition. It's not easy. It's still a challenge. But it's much harder to rethink what you're doing and why whether, as the previous panel discussed briefly, you want to have carriers, for example, in a world in which they'll be locatable on the surface of the Earth in the decades to come through improved sensors and artificial intelligence. 
So my bottom line message is, the, this is an attractive proposition because it's true, it's meaningful, it's relevant, it's important. But in fact, from the standpoint of the core military bureaucracy, it's a way of externalizing the problem. And it avoids the core issues, which is really what we ought to be talking about. And therefore, I would encourage not just a panel like this, which is very useful, but a panel that talks about the core issues. So Richard asked to speak last. And now we know why, because <laughs> he's been able to take the subject of this book and project us forward and really ask the tough question about innovation inside government itself. Which is, of course, easier to ask than answer. Yeah, right, but you've identified a key question. We're going to take questions. Doug, you had an action list. Can you give us that action list? And then we're sure. going to go to the audience. He'll be on. So um, I actually want to go to this permeable membrane uh, that uh, my friend and mentor, uh, Richard Danzig, just men uh, mentioned. Because I, I actually, while I agree completely with everything you just said about what the core issue is, I actually think the permeable membrane to both ideas and talent is not only the short-term solution to getting things flowing a little bit better, but is actually a major part of the long-term solution to that problem. Um, so uh, if, if, you know, f first of all, we, we simply have to make it easier for, uh, for the best uh, ideas and concepts to come from, to flow from the private sector uh, into the national security world. Um, today, if, uh, if you're a large company, uh, the ROI of, uh, of all of the work that you have to do, the risk that you potentially take on, and merely the paperwork that you've, uh, that you've got to do in order to effectively serve the federal government is, uh, it, it dwarfs, uh, well, the ROI is, is difficult to make the math work frequently compared to almost anything that you could do with that same, uh, same technology. And if you're a small company, it may be something that's just almost impossible to take on. Um, uh, and uh, organizations like the Defense Innovation Unit uh, were created to help make that easier and are doing a great job, but we still have this issue of what I call the catcher's mitt, which is when you take the, the great ideas that are in the, I think, 100 projects that Defense Innovation Unit is working on right now, and then have to get them to scale. Um, and that's where they hit all of the antibodies that you talked about. Uh, and where uh, and where we we lose a lot of momentum. And Doug, we should just explain these defense innovation units were established by Secretary Ash Carter, That's the right. Obama administration, to be outposts of the Pentagon. <laughs> here he is, <laughs> right here, in Austin, Texas, Palo Alto, or Mountain View, excuse me, and Cambridge, Mass. Right up your alley, brother. <laughs> just want to so everyone has that information. Okay. okay so, um, uh, so. So then the question is, how do we, I think it goes back a little bit to the, to the culture, and it's how do we become a more permeable membrane uh, for, for talent that ultimately creates an environment in which we have a much better catcher's mitt for those ideas. So a couple of concrete uh, things that I think we ought to do. First, and I think you, you alluded to this, Richard, we need to make service in something like the Defense Innovation Unit far more desirable. Um, just like we had a hard time for a, uh, for a long time making joint something that was desirable until we forced it, um, we need to make this much more desirable. Today, uh, while we get a lot of the best talent there, um, it's, it's hard because those people are taking a risk with their careers because uh, they've got to leave the real work of whatever it is they do to go off and do this weird thing that their community back in the core military doesn't necessarily understand for a while. And it's not necessarily clear what's going to happen to them over time. So that has implications for the way that we think about things like promotion board precepts and, uh, and, and, uh, and other kinds of requirements. We've got to make it much more desirable. Second, we've got to do a much better job of leveraging the people that we already have with native fluency in both these uh, environments. Um, that's a birthright that, that we have in this country because we have such a strong uh, reserve force in the same way that we have uh, such a strength in this country because we have people who grew up speaking native languages uh, from other, uh, other countries. It's a huge strength in the United States. We aren't leveraging that well enough. We need to do a better job of finding the ones that we already have, leveraging them effectively, and making more of them. That's making more of them by catching more of the ones who want to leave active duty 
in order to go into the, into the technology sector, into the reserves and into some form of the reserves that helps them to use that skill and develop more of it. It's uh, making more of them by sending more people from active duty through some of the kinds of programs like the Secretary of Defense Fellows Program that exists, uh, service fellowships that exist that send people out into the private sector for an experience and bring them back. But again, like the Defense Innovation Unit, that's potentially very risky for an officer's career. Um, and so we need to think about how we make that not risky. Um, we also need to think about uh, flow in the other direction. So things like the Defense Digital Service. How do we scale that? How do we leverage it even more effectively? How do we make sure that the right companies know about it so it's not just the kind of the same usual suspects who are sending people to go help with that? That's something that I think a lot of people in places like Silicon Valley would love to be part of. Um, if we figured out a way to work with industry uh, to, to, make it, uh, to make it more effective. Um, and so this is, this is a, a, a set of list of things, but we need to do more to make that porosity of, uh, of the system there to make the permeable membrane to talent to ultimately deal with the antibodies that you talked about. Great, thanks to these incredible panelists. Questions from this audience for this panel? Everything's crystal clear, right? Any questions? Well, you, you might I, emphasize that you'll take questions from people who are students. Uh, yes, we take questions from people who have not been our students. Greg, Greg is the exception there. Um, okay, I'm a professor. I'll just ask more questions. So as we move forward, um, give us a sense, how is the Trump administration doing in trying to achieve clarity of national purpose, reach out from the United States government to the uh, academic communities, research universities, Sylvia, as well as the private sector, uh, in both recognizing the problem and trying to tighten this innovation triangle so that we can move forward. The last panel said, we're in a major competition right now with China. It's started, and we may not be leading in that competition. Who would like to assess the Trump administration or just give some advice for what that administration and future administration should do? Chris. Everyone's looking at me, so. Um so here's what I would say. I would say, you know, kind of building on my comments, and you know, we're talking about teachers and students. You know, Richard has reminded me of a great lesson: is if you uh, answer the question you want to answer rather than the question that you were given. Um, but please answer my question. Well, I will answer your question just like I answered it the first time. Um, I actually, what I would say, one thing that the the administration has done well um, inside the national security space is I actually think the national defense strategy has gone a long way to sharpening and clarifying what our priorities should be. Secretary Mattis' 2017 Correct. strategy. Um, and being willing to say, these are things that are more important than those things. These are priorities, pacing threats that we need to uh, identify. And in particular, great power competition, uh, you know, building off of a lot of the work that Secretary Carter did, uh, this needs to be the national priority. And then beginning to build down from that so what operational problems do we actually need to solve if we say at the high level of principle that these are the things we care about? Um, that's work that I think a lot more has to be done on. And it's only in doing that work that you begin to understand, one, you know, can you solve this problem the same old way? And the answer is obviously no. Um, but two, how would you actually employ these new technologies to create comparative advantage or competitive advantage again? Um, and I think that's work that, you know, has yet to be done that still needs to be done. And it's only once you've really defined what are those problems and how do you solve them that you can begin to say, I now need to go out and put real bets on the following technology areas or capability areas that are gonna be decisively important for us. And Chris, just to recall for this audience, I'm gonna call on Richard and then Sylvia in a minute. Secretary Mattis said in December 2017 in that strategy report that since 9-11, until that time, the United States government had said three administrations, Bush 43, Obama, and the first year of Donald Trump, that combating terrorism was the number one national priority. Secretary Mattis said that's an important priority, but competition from Russia and China is now the focal point of our efforts. That was a big shift. Maybe it had been underway for a while, but he declared it then. Richard. Well, I, I just wanted to offer a general perspective which underlay my comments as well. Um, I think there's much uh, to criticize the Trump administration over lack of emphasis on science, lack of clarity about uh, particular technology initiatives and the like.
But I, I think our general proposition ought to be that um, we ought to ask ourselves first, what can we do within the context of what exists and not externalize the problem to the Trump administration or China uh, or industry before we do that? And uh, in the example I gave about AI, the personnel system is not something that the White House issues strategy declarations about. It's up to the internal organs of the military itself to deal with that. The collection of their data and the labeling of it, the gold in this new system, is not something that the national strategy will speak to in ways that are material. And yeah, it's relevant what's happening out there with regard to self-driving cars and the like, but no amount of data on self-driving cars is ultimately going to inform the military equation. I disagree some with Kai-Fu Lee and some of the speakers in the last panel when they talk about how China's commercial accumulation of data will affect the military world. Yeah, it has some influence, but military data is rather different from the civilian data. So we ought to try and get through the tendency to talk about the bigger policy issues, which are important, but come to grips with what we can do ourselves. Thank you, Richard. Sylvia, I want to bring you back in because you have had these diverse experiences. If you were in government today, advising the president or a cabinet officer, how would you think about where we should go? I, I actually would um, take Richard's point, but I would do an and. Uh, and I think Richard's point is a very important one. It's important for universities, it's important in government. Increasing the nimbleness, your ability, I think what Richard's talking about is the ability to embrace, use, and be a part of a future that is technology driven in wherever sector you're in is extremely important. And so if I were in government today, what I would do is think about the tools, some of the tools that Doug was talking about, think about how we use digital services. Uh, we created it when I was at OMB to bring in people from industry and sector to change that. You, you bring them in and they're there. They're a part of the change internally, to Richard's point. So I think it is important to just go ahead, if you're in government, what is it we need to change? What can I change at the National Security Council? What can I change at the Defense Department? What can I change at the State Department? How can I change thing at HHS and the pieces that connect. At the same time, I do think the way you do that change and get some of that change is through the strategic prioritization and saying, this is important, it will be rewarded, it is a priority for what we're trying to achieve. And so I think it's the combination uh, of the two things together that would be important. And I, the one thing I would just question in Chris's analysis, which I very much appreciate, is Who's going to make the contribution of basic research? So in the world that you described, which is the, the, that focus on applied, things that go in the scaling, the, the, the government, I agree with you wholeheartedly. There are two ways things scale in the world. My experience in philanthropy and government. One is markets and the other is government. So I agree with you that government should be the scale play, but I do think we're kind of left with a question of where does the basic research get done if you take government out of um, that equation in, in a real way? So we now have people with hands up, but we've <laughs> run out of time. So I would ask you to hold your questions for Ash Carter. <laughs> and I need to thank Sylvia and Doug and Chris and Richard for a fabulous panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go for it. Thanks, Greg. Great step. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm well. Awesome. Excuse me. So we're going to begin. We're going to begin our last panel. Um, it's with my friend and colleague, um, Secretary Ash Carter. As you all know, Ash was Secretary of Defense for President Obama. Ash, like the members of the last panel, is a hybrid person. 
uh, Ash has a PhD in physics, um, and then long career at Harvard Kennedy School as an academic, long career in government. We served together in the Bill Clinton administration, working on Russia and Ukraine together in the mid 1990s. He first worked for Casper. We need a working mic. Um, first worked for Casper Weinberger. Long career in government. Um, now back, we sit about 20 feet from each other and on one corner at, at Harvard Kennedy School. Ash came to, is a member of our group. He came to the conference and gave the first foundational lecture. We call it the Ernest May Memorial Lecture. Ernest May was an eminent uh, professor at Harvard. He was an historian an historian of American diplomacy, of international politics. He used to come to our meetings when I first joined the Aspen Strategy Group. He would always give us the comprehensive framework lecture as we started. How should we think about this problem from an historical perspective? Ash gave the lecture, which is the first chapter of the book that you're all going to buy, which is right here. <laughs> and um, Ash, I wanted you to, I wanted to start by asking you to maybe explain that lecture, the points you were trying to make, which was how have we negotiated this transition, the various transitions in 70 years as a science and technology power? And uh, welcome. Thank, uh, th thanks, Nick, and it's good to see everyone here. I'm not in Washington very often, and already saw a number of friends. Nick, th I uh, thank and commend you, Joe Condi, for making technology uh, the theme at Aspen this summer, and that's not only because I'm a physicist and and that's what I'm doing now at, at Harvard and also MIT, um, but because it's it is the subject of the day. When I walked out of the Pentagon after 37 years from the day I walked in, <laughs> almost literally to the day I walked in, two years and whatever five days ago. Um, I said to myself, what a, I, I care very much about defending our country, making a better world for our children. I've, I've, I've done that. What's the next crusade for me personally? And uh, to me, it is dealing with the dilemmas that technological change continues to throw up for human life. You see that in the digital world, in spades, in a number of ways, which I'm sure we'll discuss. And uh, I just heard uh, Doug Beck uh, talking about, I'm sure others as well. Uh, if you if you think that is a mixed bag, is, and it is, and, and one of the things I wanted to say at Aspen was how we can do better in dealing with these digital dilemmas of uh, social media or artificial intelligence and so forth, if you, if you think that's a mixed bag, think about the bio-revolution which is to come. And then there is the issue of jobs and training and the fact that uh, we, if too many of our citizens feel that technology is something which is zipping by them with heedless disregard for their own welfare, we're not gonna have a cohesive society. And so in those three areas, digital, bio, and jobs and training, I tried to go back in time a little bit, the way Ernest May would have, and say, what can we learn a little bit from history? Let me tell you a little piece of, a little piece of that, first of all, which uh, uh, touches me personally. I am a physicist, and the people who brought me up in physics were the Manhattan Project generation. And they were my mentors and tutors. And they had done something, they had invented a, what we would call today a disruptive technology, the bomb. And they were proud of that because it had ended World War II and it had kept the peace for 50 dark years of, and dangerous years of Cold War. But they also realized that with it came a, an existential danger to humanity. And they gave themselves, and this is uh, 
Richard Garwin, Edward Teller, Sidney Drell, Hans Bethe, these were the people. And in the various ways and in the various politics and so forth, they all devoted themselves to uh, arms control, non-proliferation, missile defense, civil defense. That is to using their inventive minds to soften the impact. And the, the, what they were telling people like me, and that's how I got into defense in the first place, is that with knowledge comes responsibility. And uh, I gave a little try to defense uh, early on just as a part-time thing in very much the way Doug Beck was talking about. And that's what I, one of the things I tried to replicate as Secretary of Defense. Let people give it a try. Because I found that in my own life, that the combination of having a little bit of expertise so that what you knew actually mattered to something, the other part of consequence, was a magical combination for a young person. And I think that's true today. I, 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 I see it every, every day. And if they feel that spark and ultimately that weight, I think we can do a lot better. So that was the generation I came into. There was a generation that came after my neck, which very much informed the digital revolution, which was different, which was more libertarian. And I, I respect that. It was a different generation and a different time. And the belief was, was that good things would come through openness and freedom and liberty, and that was a spirit in which the internet grew up, and that was a good thing, and I participated in that, same as everybody else. But I think we underestimated the dark side. And now it's a great thing, and it enables commerce and community, but also hate and uh, uh, darkness and aggression and, and so forth. Russian and, intervention. Uh, uh, at Russia. China, I mean, let me keep going. North Korea, uh, Iran. Uh, North Korea, Iran, uh, those are the big four, not to mention all the terrorists. Uh, and then you, so uh, there's a little strategy for you right there on one hand. Um, and uh, I, I, I think there's a lot we can do about those things. And I've, can I give you one little example? I'll give you one little example that comes from watching the hearings let's say the Mark Zuckerberg hearings on the Hill or subsequent tech leaders. And my impression of those is that they were a huge missed opportunity. It was an historic moment where had both sides been better prepared and better inclined, we could have made an advance on this nagging problem on our civilization. And uh, the leaders, uh, industry leaders, for their part, I think kind of, uh, the way I'd put it, is got through the news cycle, but aren't going to get through the arc of history with that story. And the members, uh, I, 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 I only wish, Nick, that they had been as poorly prepared to question me about war and peace and <laughs> you and your day as they had been to ask questions. But imagine something different. Imagine where. Everybody had gone in, because the subtext of the whole thing was that some mixture of self-regulation by companies and informed regulation by government, either antitrust or some other kind, would was needed. Everybody was kind of saying that. But there was no architecture out there. Is this at a 2080 mix, an 8020 mix? What, what are the options? And that they could be debated, but there wasn't even anything on the on the table. And the example I want to give you of a time when it was better, and, um, uh, and Nick, was a, a little something I saw long ago that I think could be something like it could be rebuilt on the congressional side. And it was this. I, my first thing ever was those same people I talked to said, hey, Ash, the thing that you've got to go to Washington for one year and do is this. This is going to sound like old ancient history to you, but it, but it was what to do with the MX missile. The MX missile was a 10 warhead ICBM, peak of the Cold War, height of the Cold War. Soviets were building, we felt we needed to match. We built this missile and then the question was, what do you do with a big missile um, that will 
uh, allow it to survive the onslaught of a Soviet first strike, that being a necessary consideration, and Nick is a participant in many of those armed arms control negotiations, you know the lore, you don't want to have vulnerable weapons because vulnerable weapons are a danger to both sides because the owner of them has to use them and the beholder of that knows that they better go first or so, so forth and so it's, it's, it's not a good thing. So what to do with the, and say, so you get this important problem, you gotta go to Washington where it's a technical problem, you gotta work on it. And I went and I worked on that for a year, and, but never mind that, the process was kind of interesting. There was an organization, it was called the Office of Technology Assessment at the time, never mind that place or that thing, but it had a mechanism which was this. It had a bipartisan, bicameral board that decided what it would work on, first ingredient. Second, it had it appointed over us, a few physicists, a bunch of re senior retired people, senior officials, senior military officers, retired congressmen and senators, people from the states that would be essentially paved over to do what we were gonna do at the time, our first option. And then we went out and looked at all the options, and I mean all the options, moving them around on planes, trucks, trains, burying them. I even, one of the things, options I looked at was a 14 million foot airship. Would have been the largest airship since the Graf Zeppelin, which would fly around with this missile hanging. I mean, imagine that, a crowd pleaser. It was never built. And uh, No, 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 <laughs> but the point was that we did, we, we, we looked at all the options and gave a respectful hearing, even to things that were kind of fringy like that. And then the last thing is that we talked to every stakeholder in, in industry, in the states, every member, uh, every industry group, every lobbyist, every member, and so, so that everybody could say they were heard. Well, those were four pretty good ingredients to giving Congress. I'd like to see something like that start, and then I think we can begin to climb on these top of these things, whether they be digital, Nick, or whether they be biology, or whether they be jobs and training. Those are the three baskets. We gotta get to solutions or we're, we're, we're gonna be in trouble. So when Tom Donnell was on this stage before you, Ash, about an hour ago, he said, bring back that office. Okay, that um, or something like as, it. As part of his action plan. So Ash, part of what we've been talking today and in the book and in your lecture that you gave last August, the first chapter of our book, the relationship sometimes quite troubled between the federal government, mm -hmm. the Pentagon, the Congress, and the tech community. One of your innovations, you thought about this a lot as Secretary of Defense, was I'm gonna send people out. Yeah. I'm gonna establish DOD offices in Silicon Valley, in our hometown, Boston, Cambridge, Massachusetts, in Austin, Texas, and we're gonna I, learn from each other. I would have other. done more also over time. Was it I successful? Um, what would you advise Acting Secretary Shanahan to do now? with those offices, was it sufficient? Was it as ambitious enough? I mean, how do you account for it? I, I, I think it's worked out well, and I'll tell you why I think that, but it's not, it's not sufficient. It, it was one piece of a broader mosaic. I didn't know at the time, that's why I called it D-I-U-X, experimental. I said, and actually we Defense fault. Innovation. Defense Innovation, Innovation Unit. Unit experimental. experimental. And Jim, my successor, Jim Mattis, who I've known for 25 years, Jim, to his, credit, or, or to maybe to the credit of the, of the idea and the people like Doug Beck who were working on it, it earned taking the X away. But it didn't look like that way at first. In fact, we stumbled in a few ways at first. And we, we it's a few things that didn't work and we had to start over again and so forth. And we were trying to meet the valley in or Boston or Austin. I would have done Dayton and a few others if I had. Um, halfway, uh, these are people who like me when I started out, I, when I did that MX thing, I didn't want to be in government, I, 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 I wanted to stay doing what I was doing, uh, which, was, which was physics. I was happy to give it a try, but I didn't want to live in Washington. Now it turns out it stuck more to me than it will to most, but that's okay. Um, and uh, that means meeting people both ways. And you know, this was the time when we had Edward Snowden 
as an overhang, and you can imagine what I think of Edward Snowden. Um, but you had to agree to disagree about certain things in order to reach a point where, and you could say to someone, come on and, 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 and give it a try. Overwhelmingly, even skeptical. And I had people in the Pentagon, I led it in the Defense Digital Service, who had their hoodies on, their aviator glasses on their head, their earrings, and it was a little bit difficult for those of us who look like this or have a uniform on. Um, and so we had to be flexible in the interests of building this bridge. So it takes a little flexibility on, on both sides. Um, but that, the digital service and so forth, and at the same time, remember we spend $80 billion a year, which is more than all the big tech companies combined. Um, and at the same time, we needed to do, and that, that was being mentioned, I think, by Chris and the last, by everybody in the last panel, making that transition, that great transition that we're still embarked on from the era of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, which we so focused on, and I'm as guilty as anyone. I mean, when I was Undersecretary for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, and it was 2010, and we were surging into Afghanistan, you bet your life that was a preoccupation. You got people fighting, you're all in for them. And I was all in for them, and I was spending as much time buying MRAPs and dogs, sniffing dogs, as I was, F-35s and stuff like that, and yes, it was attractive, but now you, we got to get back to the main game here, which is China, Russia, and so forth. And, to, and we spent too long backing off of that agenda. I'm, I'm glad to see us back in there. I, I uh, 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 was, was doing that myself and would have continued, and I, I'm glad to see it continued, uh, continuing under Jim Madison, now the acting secretary, Pat Shanahan. Thank you, Ash. So we're going to open this up to questions, but before we do, one of the predominant questions today, but also throughout this book, two big questions. General Dunford, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who you know exceptionally well, Eric Lander, someone else you know well, have both said from a military and scientific point of view, we risk losing our primacy. Mm -hmm. Eric Lander, as the leading science and technology country in the world because of the breakdown of the innovation triangle. General Dunford, the speed with which AI, machine learning, quantum computing, biotech revolutions are proceeding means that our current platform systems could be obsolete in the generation ahead, and we could lose the race yep. Yep. Of, for military superiority. That's everything to us, for those of us who think about American foreign and defense policy. Do you agree? I mean, are you ringing the, the village bell uh, as loud as they are? Absolutely, I agree. I, you know, look, we're, 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 we're great, we're inventive, we're powerful, we've got a great legacy, we've got a great installed base, but this is a competitive world, and nobody has a birthright. Uh, and, and these guys, our enemies are hungry, and they're focused on us. You know, we may say we have Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, terrorism, cricket, as I used to call them, they, and we do. But they all have just us. They're all looking just at us. So... Uh, it, it's not a birthright, Nick, and that preoccupation I talked about was a distraction in some ways, and we pay a little price in that. I don't know how you measure it in years. We got to we got to get that back, and um, I'm not pessimistic about this, but I think it's something we have to to uh, to work at. You can't take it for granted. They're out for us. When you sat with President Obama and the national security team, but really your relationship with him. Was this something that really drove him? Did he, he recognize it and wanted to mobilize the U.S. government around it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it did. I, I remember, President Obama was somebody who was not a technologist himself, but both generationally and by intellectual inclination sort of technologically interested. And he... he, he evidence that in, in many ways. So he followed defense stuff, sometimes to the dismay of his department uh, cl uh, closely, some, some, some technology things. But yeah, he, he was interested um, in it, and I think may, was also making that transition in the 
glad, I'm glad to see it going, and I'm not one of these believe, people who believes that the whole world changes in the, every change of administration, even in the current circumstances, uh, unusual as, 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 as this can be. Um, and so that has been going on. It started then. I'm glad to see it continue. But, I mean, we got to put our, our heads down. And the other thing that we didn't have back in the Soviet Union, Nick, and you, you know that because, you know, you as ambassador and so forth uh, and, and to NATO and that part of the world know very well, we had a long-standing competitive relationship with another major power, which was technologically potent. The Soviet Union was no joke, um, and they, they, they were a serious competitor. But we, we did not have an economic relationship with them. And so we have never had a sustained economic relationship with a communist dictatorship and controlled economy. And that's what China is. I mean, there's no nice way to say that. And in the case of the Soviet Union, we had an impermeable barrier between us and them. We did not trade with them. You remember the whole export control system and so forth. So it was a different kind of relationship. Now we are inextricably entwined with China economic. That makes it harder to create an enclave and then on top of that, there's so much technology which is outside of government. You know, in, in those days, well, anything that happened that mattered happened in America. And most of that happened under government bucks. That neither of those is no longer true. So you put those together and the government's writ over technology doesn't run as widely as it once did. That and the fact that China has access substantially in real time to the same body of innovation as we have puts an extra burden on us to be better at incorporating that into our uh, 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 public protection. Thank you very much. So um, in this year, we focus on one big issue a year, uh, Democrats, Republicans, independents, nonpartisan. We're going to be in Aspen. We're going to focus on the U.S.-China relationship, and Ash has just been talking about that. I think a lot, a lot of us feel, almost everybody feels, it's the most important challenge we face in the next half century. We're the two dominant societies. We're competing in a battle of ideas, authoritarianism versus a democratic system. We're competing in this battle of technology, the race for the next generation of military technology. We're also going to have this year, for the first time, we will be sponsoring and running the Aspen Security Forum, which is the public. Um, Aspen program in the middle of July. For four days, we're going to have a national debate on many of these issues and U.S.-China, the technology battles, the ideological battles that Xi Jinping is fighting with us. That's going to be center stage two. And I can't think of anything more important that Americans should be doing in talking about these issues. And Ash is going to be a big part as one of our senior members of all of that. So questions for, for Ash Carter. Yes, please, and just please identify yourself, and a mic's going to come to you right now, within 2.3 seconds. You can ask your question. Yes, hello. Thank you for your discussion. Ina Barron, also Kansas School student, uh, 2003, Graham Allison, Ernest May was one of my professors as well. Um, so my question is, considering that we cannot probably outspend Russia and China on defense, I'd like to ask is what can we do to create the right level of overmatch on capabilities? S and T and E capabilities that is also most affordable economically. Thank you. Uh, I, I, the key is science and technology, first of all, uh, and so it is. I and I do think we, even as <coughs> clumsy as we can be, and I'm embarrassed to say that as an institution, the Defense Department still it is a pretty good imbiber of technology that's out there. And our tech sector is extremely vibrant. And so I'm not pessimistic at all about our ability to overmatch others, just to answer your question. Also, you know, Nick, uh, what you say is absolutely right. United States and China will be the big dogs, but we're not the only dogs around. And if you look at Asia, rather than China, 
China is kind of half of the Asian population and, and, and economics. I, I always say we don't have a China policy. We have an Asia policy. We always have. We've had one for, what, 80 years, Nick? And it has been the pivotal American military in the role region which has kept the peace there. And that is appreciated by that other half. So in addition to being technologically excellent, in addition to spending still quite a lot of money on defense, and I was always grateful for it, and in, in addition to having spent that much more money than everybody else for a long time, which means our installed base is vast, in addition to being the most experienced military in the world, because we've been at war for 15 years, in addition to all that, we have all the friends and allies, and they have none. So that's a pretty powerful weight on our side, which, I, as I said, I'm not going to be complacent, but I'm not pessimistic either. If I can just add to this, Ash and I have both spent a lot of time in government working on our relationship with India. I and the George W. Bush administration, Ash and the Obama administration. Especially. India, big science and technology com country, big talent in the population, commitment to have a first class Air Force and Navy. India is our security partner. Ash helped to build that relationship. Japan, Australia, South Korea, treaty allies. So it is, you can't just compare China and the United States, it's our alliance system which has held the balance of power for, as you say, for 75 years. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I thought you might get a kick out of knowing that while you were working on the MX missile problem, a lot of us who are advocates, uh, my name is Don Wilson, I work with foundations and nonprofits, we're also cutting our teeth on the MX missile. And until we met some of your folks who ensured us that we had these things called submarines and we were going to be okay, <laughs> that uh, made us they're, feel They're pretty good, too. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's been obviously, or the thing that's been an elephant in every room in any American policy discussion since 2016, of course, literally an elephant, uh, is whether or not uh, Russia successfully invaded and changed the election in 2016. And as you are one of our most uh, distinguished diplomats, and you are one of the best defense secretaries we've had the luck of having, I wonder what you both think of that proposition and what you think we should do about it. Well, sure they did. They obviously did. Uh, I, I, the evidence is overwhelming uh, that they did. It's, it's also obvious, uh, I'll say this, that not enough has been done. I don't believe enough was done by the Obama administration and not enough has been done. <coughs> we haven't done enough. And in a more serious way, uh, uh, I, I, this gets us sort of far afield, but I'll just say one thing, which is, um, an attack is an attack and deserves a response, even though this is kind of the in, in between -y sort of Russian hybrid warfare, little green men kind of version, uh, it, 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 it's aggression. And so they certainly tried to influence our politics, not just in the electoral sense, but just sometimes just stirring up gratuitous division. And they're doing it to this day. So that's what I would say, Nick. And I would agree and just say this. Um, Putin cannot, the Russian Federation cannot match the United States and our Canadian and European allies in Central and Western Europe in a conventional sense. They're contained. So what has he done? He's developed this hybrid strategy. It's intelligence operations. It's the use of cyber means to infiltrate social media. He attacked our electoral system and got into 23 of the databases of our state electoral systems. And he continues to do it. There is ample evidence that he had tried to insinuate himself and his country into the Dutch, French, and German elections in 2017. And a lot of Brits think that they might have affected the Brexit vote in June of 2016. So it's continuing. And I would say that President Trump has been blind to admit it. He has not led on this issue. Congress has had to leave. Senator Burr and Senator Warner in their select committee, we need presidential leadership to raise the defenses and, as Ash just said, respond, because that's the language that Putin understands. Yes, sir, please. 
uh, Edward Luce from the Financial Times. Um, welcome, Ed. Hi, Nick. Um, <laughs> you've just been talking about Russia. I mean, I presume from the sort of larger picture in terms of America's interests, defending America's interests, you don't want to pursue a diplomacy in which Russia and China are driven together, a sort of reverse Nixon, reverse Kissinger. Um, and yet, that's kind of what's happening. And even if Trump weren't president, given what you've just been talking about, the level of justifiable concern about Russia's interference in uh, America and other democracies, there's going to be antagonism towards Russia, uh, understandable ant antagonism from any successor to Donald Trump. So China and Russia look destined to get closer and closer together, which is ominous for the United States and for the West. How, how would you prevent that from happening, or at least loosen um, that, that relationship um, if, you were, if you were in charge? I'll, I'll go to stab, but then I think Nick Pry has a better perspective on, on, on that than I do. They have a common interest in being antagonistic towards the United States. After that, they don't have much in the way of common interests. And, you know, we've spent 50, 60 years worried about a Soviet, Chinese Soviet condominium, and it kind of never happened. So I would say they share an interest in antagonizing the United States, and to the extent their efforts are complementary, they, we have to divide our assets and our attentions between the two of them. But they have so much else that is not going in the same direction. Um, I, I won't even go through, through the checklist, but you know, China's going that way, Russia's going that way in so many, so many ways. They share an uneasy Far East and an uneasy border and so forth. So, so they share us as an antagonist, but I would say it doesn't go much further than that. But Nick, you're, you know much more about this than I do. Uh, not at all, but I'll just say, yeah, it's, it, I think it is a central question right now. There's no question that Xi Jinping and Putin are tactical allies, but tactical, not strategic. And what they want to do right now, the Chinese want to limit the power of Japan and India in the Indo-Pacific. The Russians want to limit the power of Germany, NATO, the EU, and the North Americans. And so they try to put roadblocks in front of us at the UN Security Council. And they both are using hybrid warfare to try to weaken democratic societies from within. So I think it's a considerable tactical problem. But strategically, Ash is undoubtedly right. But if you think about Russia, I think there are only something like six million Russians living uh, east of the Ural Mountains. And there's 300 million Chinese just below them. China's going to dominate the Far East. You know this better than anybody. You've lived out there. You've written books about India. They're going to dominate the, the commerce and the strategy of the Far East. And I think Ash said something very important. We have always seen ourselves since Roosevelt and Truman's time as the guarantor of stability in East Asia. It's been the American military and the American Foreign Service together in Japan and the Korean Peninsula, in Australia, in Southeast Asia. We've been the guarantor of power. If we hold the position, the Chinese will have to deal with us. And the Russians will be a declining power by 2050, given demographics and given their unreformed carbon economy. So I actually think that while this is a tactical problem now for us, the strategic problem for our kids when they're succeeding Ash as Secretary of Defense is how do you both compete with the Chinese and hold your position? And that's going to be very competitive technologically, militarily. But how do you also partner with China? Because we need to work with the Chinese on climate change. It's a huge failing of the Trump administration not to recognize that we're the two largest carbon emitters. So Joe Nye, I thought, was very wise today when he let off his panel by saying, we need to be in balance. Both political parties right now, ours, have turned towards unbridled competition with China. Yes, we have to compete. That's what this whole day has been about. But we have to work with the Chinese, too. The Chinese will see us in a very different way than the Russians. They'll see us as a potential competitor, but also their partner. And I don't think the Russians figure into that, uh, that equilibrium. Can I just say something about that as well, just to, un just to further unrelieve the, the gloom? Um, I 
worked with the Chinese for a long time, as Nick did. I have many friends in the PLA uh, and, and so forth, and we cannot have a purely antagonistic relationship. I agree with you. I mean, it, the, it has not turned out the well the way we'd hoped 20 years ago. The Chinese evolution has not gone the way that we hoped, starting with Deng Xiaoping, and we thought there would be more kind of convergence WTO of, under President of, the Clinton of values, and it hasn't happened. And we have to be awake, a wide awake to that fact. The, the wishes we all had in the 90s for the China of the future are, are, have, have not eventuated. But we have to pick ourselves up and go on, and that means you do have to have some modus vivendi uh, with them because we are, we do share the world's economy and we share the world's uh, ecosystem and, 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 you know, war and even Cold War is a pretty dark future. Um, uh, and, you know, even that my job was to prepare uh, for those, you can't say that's your, your first choice and there's nothing inevitable about that. Uh, so I think we, and what I didn't hear what Joe said, but just from your recounting of it, it sounds, it sounds, uh, it sounds sensible, and we may get much more value out of that. I, it's a little hard to see that with, with Vladimir Putin, because I always say his objective is purely to frustrate us. <coughs> Imagine trying to build a bridge to that motivation. It's a little hard. <laughs> so I think we have time for, I'm looking to Jonathan, five minutes. Maybe we'll get two questions in. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Justin Doubleday, a reporter with Inside Defense. Um, Secretary Carter, just as, as the man who wrote the last uh, Pentagon artificial intelligence policy for the use of AI, um, obviously there's a lot of debate around what the next set of policies will be. What has changed since you wrote that last policy and what sort of considerations do you think need to be taken into account as we set some new barriers. Uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know, this is what I, one thing I wrote actually as the deputy secretary in 2013, and when there was, no one was paying any attention to AI, but we were. And what it says, I think is still basically right. You can elaborate on it, but I think it's basically right. And, it, and it, it's actually a lesson for AI in general, I think, in its deployment in society. What I said was that um, as, as always, we take our values to the battlefield as a nation. I make no apologies about that. None of us ever made any apologies about that. And uh, in the matter of AI, that we, there would not be a autonomous use of lethal force, it, literally autonomous. There would always be a human being involved in the decision to use lethal force on behalf of the United States. That's not a, a, the same as man in the loop, I should say, by the way. It's not like somebody inside the computer trying to keep up with the computer. Uh, it is a ethical and accountable decision. And the reason I said that was I imagined myself or the secretary that I was working for the morning after something had happened, like an airstrike which had gone wrong and people who were not part of the intended targets were, were, were injured. And I imagined myself going before the press and saying, the machine did it. I'd be crucified. And I should be. You aren't going to take that as a, and by the way, the same thing is true, Nick, for a self-driving car that runs over somebody. The judge is going to want to know whether somebody is responsible for this. Now, that doesn't mean somebody has to be blamed over everything, because there is something called having made a mistake. And judges accept that. We all accept that. But there has to be, in order for these to be deployed in a way that makes consequential decisions that affect people, there has to be enough transparency and enough accountability in these systems that that can be built in. And I said that will be a design criterion for us in the department. By the way, I think it's ought to be a design criterion in AI everywhere. And I have to say, it has to be a design criterion because it's not automatic. You can build, and there are some of the extant AI algorithms which are very difficult to retrace the path of decision. So it is something engineers have to build in, but that's what I do for, you know, that's my life is, is running 
engineering programs and technology uh, uh, programs, and that's something that will be done if it is said. So that's what it says, and again, we can elaborate, but I think it's basically the right thing, and it's whatever, how many years later, um, six years later, it still sounds right to me. Ash, I want to give you the last word. We're, we're going to have to close this session. I want to ask you about something we really haven't talked a lot about today, and that is, where is the leadership going to come from? These are big challenges that we've talked about today. How do you compete with China and yet and not be dominated but work with them? How do we maintain the military superiority of our techno technological base? I interviewed our friend, uh, Secretary Condoleezza Rice, at Aspen a year and a half ago, summer of 2017. She's our co-chair for the Aspen Strategy Group. And I remember saying something like, you know, what do you worry, it's a public session, what do you worry about the most? I thought she'd say Iran, North Korea, Putin, China. She said, we've lost our self-confidence. I interviewed Federica Mogherini, who is in effect the EU foreign minister, at the Kennedy School where we work last month. And I said, Mrs. Mogherini, you've got a lot in your plate, Iran and Russia and China, and what are you worried about? She said, we Europeans have lost our self-confidence. I took these two statements from these senior women, world leaders, to be that we don't really have someone in Western leadership, maybe ex with the exception of Angela Merkel right now, who is saying that the democratic way, as opposed to the authoritarian way, MBS, Erdogan, the Chinese, the Russians, our democratic way is the way forward. And I think what you just intimated, that you've got confidence that the United States, that the tech community, our universities can actually meet the test of this technological revolution. Is self-confidence part of our problem? Is leadership part of our problem? It, it, it is, and I, you know, I'm not pessimistic at all. I, 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 I think we do have the best system in the world. I think our values are, uh, there are things I believe in. I want my children to live up in a, in a world like that, and, I, and most of the world wants to live that way, no matter what the, the leaders you just enumerated uh, think. So I, I, in that sense, we're playing a winning moral hand, and that still matters in this world, despite all the craziness of, 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 of the leaders like uh, the ones you, you named and all the rip-roar and technological change that goes on uh, and so forth. It will take, and I wasn't present for this earlier, but I, I, from what I infer of what you talked about earlier about this cooperation between, I think you talked about the cooperation between the world of business, the world of government, the world of thought and ideas, and I, I think it does take that coming together. But you know, a lot of the issues I, talk, I was talking about earlier about the biotech revolution, genomics, um, uh, AI, uh, social media and so forth, these are puzzling to people, but they haven't taken on the political toxicity of, of other settled issues. There's no sort of partisan rancor. People are bewildered by them. They haven't figured out how to line up anywhere. And, and that, is, that is the one hopeful thing in this, in this technological uh, picture to me is if we can make doing something sensible available in front and center, I think people may come together uh, behind it. And that's true for leadership in the world um, as well. I think there's a latent demand for it. So, I, you know, maybe I'm uh, Pollyannish, but I'm not pessimistic. Uh, Nick, and I, 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 I don't think you are by nature uh, uh, either. Bless you <laughs> for it. So, I, I don't hope people in this room aren't either. You know, I think we were in danger of depressing this group earlier <laughs> with the big threats. It's nice to leave on hope that we Americans have faith in ourselves and faith in our society. Ash, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. And thank you to all for being with us. Thank you very much.